Hello, my name is Rocky Marciano. It was as if a sculptor took a big boulder and just chiseled a fighter out of it. Marciano was a grim, destroying kind of a guy that was going to beat him up. Hello, 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 bell would ring, he would be on you. Rocky Marciano was for real. Hi, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to Ringside Rocky Marciano here on ESPN Classic. We are coming to you once again from one of boxing's most historic sites, Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn, New York. In the annals of boxing history, only one heavyweight champion was undefeated for his entire career, Rocco Francis Marchigiano, better known to fight fans as Rocky Marciano. In sports, numbers are synonymous with greatness. In basketball, 100 means Wilt Chamberlain's NBA single-game scoring record. In baseball, 56, Joe DiMaggio's hitting streak. Boxing has two numbers, 49 and 0, Marciano's career record as a pro. The Brockton blockbuster had no business being the world heavyweight champion. 5'11", short arms, weighing under 190 pounds, with footwork that was adequate at best. But Marciano cannot be measured by merely what we can see. Joining me here at Gleason's is my co-host, boxing historian, the Fedora top raconteur, an oracle of the sweet science, Bert Randolph Sugar. ESPN boxing analyst, Teddy Atlas. Hall of Fame trainer and ringside regular, Angelo Dundee. A boxing icon and championship trainer, Lou Duva. Bill Gallo of the New York Daily News. And the former two-time heavyweight champion of the world, Big George Foreman. Over the first part of his spectacular career, Rocky Marciano stormed up the heavyweight ranks with decisive victories over his idol, former heavyweight champion Joe Lewis, Lee Savold, and Kid Matthews, just to name a few. Bruising his way to a perfect 42-0 record, he challenged Jersey Joe Walcott for the heavyweight title and walked away the champion, winning on one of the most memorable punches in boxing history. In ringside, undefeated, we pick up Marciano's career after his dramatic victory over Jersey Joe. Over the next three hours, we'll roll out hard-hitting bouts versus Roland Lestarza, Ezra Charles, and a bloody confrontation with lightweight champ Archie Moore. But first, unfinished business between the new champ and Jersey Joe Walcott. I don't think Walcott can get up. It's going to be a knockout for Marciano. Now, with that epic fight, a rematch was a certainty. It took place May 15, 1953, at Chicago Stadium. Here are the introductions of the fighters. It's Marciano Walcott II. Gentlemen, here's the feature presentation of the evening. 15 rounds for the World Heavyweight Championship. From Camden, New Jersey, the challenger wearing black trunks with a white stripe, weighing 197, three-quarter pounds, the former world heavyweight champion, Jersey Joe Walcott. From Brockton, from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing white trunks with a black stripe, weighing 184, one half pounds, the world heavyweight champion, Rocky Marciano. And now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, referee Frank Sakura and the instructions for both contestants. Fifteen rounds, three more bouts to follow. You boys received your instructions from the Illinois State Athletic Commission. I'm here to enforce them. I want a clean break at all times. No rabbit punching, no kidney punches. Be careful of your low blows. They may cost you rounds. In case of a knockdown, I want you to go to your furthest corner and stay there till I tell you to come out fighting. This being a championship fight, the eight count is waived. Shake hands and come out fighting. 
for the heavyweight championship of the world. This fight could end in a draw under the rules. The eight-second uh, rule is waived, and uh, more than three knockdowns in one round are permitted. Good evening, everyone. They get out there quietly. Walker backing away. Put the light scarab on the chin with his left hand. Marciano on a cross, leaning a little bit to his right. Now Walcott crouches, takes a short hook on the chin, put a light jab on the chin. On the inside, they tie each other up as they go into a neutral corner. Now they're long range. Marciano throws a short right hand to the body. Again, they go in close, and the referee, Frank Sakura, very quietly gets them apart, and they break. Marciano in that little crouch, leaning a little bit to the right. Walcott standing straight up, brings in a short left on the chin, puts out a straight jab. Marciano disregards it, goes in close, and puts a light left hand to the body. They're just in the feeling out stage now, but look out, because Walcott is a sneak hitter with either hand. He's got dynamite in both of them, and so is Marciano. Marciano, a short hook on the chin on the inside. Marciano puts a light right hand to the body, and round one, at least so far, is a bit tame. There's a short left on the chin by Marciano. Walcott put two light punches with one each hand to the body. Two minutes to go in round one of a 15-round, if it goes that far. Heavyweight championship of the world at stake. Walcott banking along the road, steps under a long right thrown by Marciano. On the inside, Walcott puts a couple of light right hands to the body, and then comes in with a short right hand to the jaw as he comes out of that clinch. Walcott scores with a sharp jab, takes a light hook to the body, rips a hard right on Marciano's head, and they go in close again and tie each other up. Walcott looks just a little bit the cooler of the two, well, he's got a lot more experience. He backs towards the ropes now, shuffles a little bit, steps under a wild hook thrown by Marciano, and they clinch over in Rocky's corner. And the champion and challenger get apart when the referee tells them. Half the round is gone. Marciano with a short jab. Takes a light hook on the chin. Going by Walcott. Walcott back with another jab. Marciano anxious to get in there and get it over if he can. Walcott bangs along, backs along the ropes. Takes a long left hand to the body. Walcott a long range. Marciano digs him to the body with that left hand again. <coughs> Walcott backing towards the ropes now. Marciano the aggressor throws a hard right that lands high on the head. Walcott just moving away from the punch in time. And they clinch again on the ropes. There's the referee getting them apart. Less than a minute to go in round one. Walcott back toward a neutral corner. Puts a jab on the chin. Marciano goes a hard race to the chin, and Walcott is down on his back. Three, four, five, six, seven. He's sitting there. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, did he beat the counter, didn't he? No, oh, they claim he did. it's all over. The referee, the referee says Rocky Marciano by a knockout. By a knockout in round one. time was two minutes and 25 seconds, which does not make it the fastest knockout in heavyweight championship fights, but still awfully quick. The match is definitely over and done with, but the verbal sparring certainly is not. Jersey Joe is standing in his corner with the Florio brothers and his manager. Bokikio carries his complaint to someone at ringside. He pops his head through the ropes outside of them to make himself heard. The manager was later to register an official protest about the disputed count. All right, so there it is. Rocky Marciano defends his heavyweight title, and Bert makes you say, hmm, kind of dubious. Dubious or legit? I have to tell you, I think that punch landed eight months earlier and a thousand miles away. Walcott went down a second time just remembering what had happened to him in Philadelphia in the first fight. He also was getting 225,000 more than Marciano, by the by. And I think he just took it and went home with it. This was he, his ending. This, yeah, but did, Bert, did he show signs of that in his career? Not really, never, right? Never, but he was, an, he was turned into an old man in that first fight in Philadelphia. And now he's got a retirement nest egg. And he's going to sit on it right here while the count goes. And you'll see him, and he can get up, hand on rope, alert. And he's just watching, and he gets up, Frank Sikor, and there he goes, he's out. And now he takes it with a little bit of just a moan and goes to his corner. What happens now very, very quickly is the crowd starts booing. First round, knockout, two minutes and some odd seconds. 
And he now starts after he hears the booze stomping around the ring, hollering. In a it huff. was a quick count. Then he was in a huff. It was a quick count. Angelo, we know Rocky's got that type of power, but uh, did that connect? Well, what happens there, the, I see Walcott waving at the guy. You never wave at a puncher because they get their distance, they can nail you with the shot. Now, Walcott was trying to offset him, but he didn't fight the first fight. And I think he remembered the first fight. He took that shellacking. I think maybe, hey, what do I need this for? He was a little getting up in age and everything. Mm -hmm. The legs are getting a little more shot, you know. Teddy, not that we want to be cynical, but you watch that and you think, all right, uh, what's going on there? Legitimate shot? Well, he got hit with the right uppercut, but would he have taken that in the first fight? Yes, probably would have. I've noticed through the history of boxing that when you take an old-time guy that's experienced, been around a long time like a Walcott, and he gives everything he can, and he can't give anything more in the first fight, and he doesn't win it, the second time his resistance is not as high. Hmm. He figures there's nothing more I can do. I'll tell you an interesting story. Don Shargan, Hall of Fame promoter, uh, the Silver Fox, they call him, from California, he told me an interesting story. He said that he talked to Walcott before the second fight. And he said that Walcott said, I did everything I could do, and I still didn't win. There's nothing more I can do. He said that before the fight. Hmm. Interesting. And, and did everybody get inside? No. Bert, you said it was tough getting in there, right? Chicago Stadium, a big heavyweight championship fight, their first in a long time since I think the Braddock and Lewis fight. Big night out. Traffic jams all around the stadium. There's still people who remember being there and checking their coat while they heard the roar inside and never saw the mm, fight. Never got in there. And this is it for Jersey Joe, right? He just went home. That's it. Took his 225000 and slowly faded in the east after he'd faded in the Midwest here in the fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Angie. I was thrilled with Frank Sakura. He was looking at Joe Walcott, and Joe Walcott was probably looking at him. What are you joking? One, <laughs> the two. It was a Jack Dempsey count, for God's sake. And the guy, he wasn't going to go nowhere. Forget right, right. about it. He was still on the canvas by the time he got to 10. Yeah. He was happy. Got to you. you know, you can look at a more contemporary example. You remember the first great fight with Orguello, Alexis Orguello and Aaron Pryor? I mean, what a fight. What, what a, a fight. fight yeah. And Aguero did anything he could do in that fight, and there was nothing left. The second fight, he didn't come up with the resistance anywhere near. It was an easy fight for Pryor. So I really think that when you got an all-time guy, Aguero was an all-time guy, Walcott was an all-time guy, and they do everything they can do with the younger guy the first time, and they lose the second time they're going in there done. Well, excellent point. So the second time around, it took uh, two minutes, 25 seconds. The vicious uh, combination, we believe, from Marciano and Walcott uh, was done. Still ahead, you convinced me. Says still ahead, Marciano does battle with another former heavyweight champion, Ezard Charles. The pair engaged in two slugfests, both fighters going to their limits and beyond. We'll have those epic duels when we come up. But next, Marciano puts on another punishing clinic against Roland Lestarza. This is ringside, Rocky Marciano, right here on ESPN Classic. I'm Brian Kenny. Welcome back to Ringside. Rocky Marciano from Gleason's Gym here in Brooklyn. Back on March 24th, 1950, the young Marciano fought another unbeaten, highly regarded fighter named Roland Lestarza. It was Marciano's first fight after nearly killing Carmine Vingo, and many experts wondered if The Rock was mentally ready to fight the clever counterpuncher from the Bronx. But Marciano knocked Lestarza down in the fourth, and after 10 rounds of thrilling toe to toe action, Marciano won the fight on a split decision. Just over three years later, the two former rivals met again in the ring. But this time, the Brockton blockbuster was the heavy favorite. But only four men had gone the distance with The Rock, and Lestarza was one of them. And if styles make fights, then Marciano Lestarza II promised to be memorable. It's September 24th, 1953. Marciano Lestarza II from the Polo Grounds. Here we go, round one, heavyweight championship of the world. Rocky Marciano with Roland Lestarza. Rocky comes out slowly, circles to his left a little bit. Lestarza throws the first blow in the fight. It's a very, very light left hand. Now he moves in with a left hook that hits a little bit high on Rocky's head. No damage done here. Rocky got Lestarza in the corner, landed a very solid left of the body there. Again, Rocky charges and lands. Lestarza moves 
along the ropes, gets out of that corner there, doesn't want to be trapped in the corner. Uh, Marciano, in typical Marciano style, is following him. Lestarza hit a hard left of the face and took a hard right to the side of the head. The champion charges in now. He's charging close. He's clinching here with Lestarza. Lestarza, coming out of that clinch, misses with a left hook. And now Roman lands a very solid right alongside of Rocky's head. Lestarza scores with a very hard right uppercut. He follows with a left to the head. The challenger steps inside of a right swing, a very murderous-looking right swing, a very hard wallop, considering that Lestarza is supposed to be a boxer and not a puncher. But Lestarza is punching in this very first round here tonight. Now Rocky swings with a typical Rocky Marciano wild right that misses by a good six inches, but nevertheless... He'll throw a lot of blows like that, and people who are Marciano fans are not going to be too concerned about Rocky missing with a wild right. The boys get together again now. Out in the center of the ring, Lestarza lands a straight left to the face. Rollin jabs now with the left hand. He follows with a very straight right to the top of the head. His jolts are a little bit hard. They've got a pretty good charge in them. They're not the knockout type of wallop, and of course, Marciano is not too damaged. No damage on either side to amount to anything in this fight as yet. Now they're out in the center of the ring once more. Looking each other over, Marciano, reluctant ever to take a backward step, keeps moving in. Lestars is beginning to move to the left a little bit now. Now Lestarza moves in. They clinch again in the center of the ring, and Lestarza works his left hand free for a very light to the side of Marciano's head. Again, the referee has to step inside, tries the boys apart. Marciano, taking just one backward step, keeps... Moving ahead, trying to move in on Lestarza. Lestarza moves over to the corner there, just to the left of our reporters at ringside. Again, Marciano is unable to trap him in the corner. Lestarza moves along those ropes, gets out there, out in the center of the ring, and is still Marciano following and throwing another wild right hand. No damage yet on either side to amount to anything in this fight, and of course, it's very, very close. Marciano lands a right hook to the head. It jolted Lestarza just a little bit, but Lestarza shook it off, clenched, and then broke. No damage in that clinch. The boys break. Nobody's hurt yet. Again, it's Lestarza jabbing to the face. Now he misses with a right hand. Lestarza jabs again. Jabs a very hard left to Rocky's head. Rocky's bo head bobs just a little bit. And now Rocky moves inside. Tries to get that right hand free and Lestarza. Just a little bit elusive. Uh, too elusive for Marciana. Moves out of the way. And there are just seconds left here now in round one of the polo grounds. There's the bell. Round one has ended. More of the Rocky Marciano Marathon ahead on ESPN Classic. Bill Gallo, Angelo Dundee, and Burt Sugar break down the rock, piling on the punishment to Roland Lestarza. Ringside will also rewind and discuss the two Marciano title fights against the man who ended Joe Lewis's historic winning streak, Ezard Charles. Then it's a special presentation of Marciano versus Archie Moore. Big George Foreman with commentary on the bout and how the old mongoose helped train him into a champion. This is ringside. Big fights, bad blood, and bodacious tales from Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn. Welcome back to ringside. Rocky Marciano here on ESPN Classic. I'm Brian Kenny. Counterpuncher Roland Lestarza had given the young Rocky Marciano a lot of trouble in their first fight in 1950. But in their second bout in 1953, Marciano was a very different proposition. He was an unstoppable force in the heavyweight division, always coming forward, always pressing and pounding his opponent. For seven rounds, the gallant Lestarza had tried to stem the tide, but in round eight, Marciano once again turned up the heat. Let's go to round eight. Marciano Lestarza two. And now Rocky Marciano moves out quickly, faster than he has at any other time in this fight, moving toward Lestarza. Moves in, smashes a very hard right to the side of the head and the right to the body. Lestarza fights back, he jabs with the left, and a right, not too much power in either one of them. Not much sting in Lestarza's left jab or the right hand he just put on Marciano's head. Now Marciano takes another right and a left to the head. Now he moves a hard right to the side of the head. The exchange left with Lestarza, and Marciano appeared to get the better of the exchange. Now it's Lestarza jabbing with a hard left, and he backs away. Lestarza's right to the head, threw Rocky off balance, caught him moving in, and Rocky started to pitch forward, started to fall down, regained his balance. That's twice as happened to him in the fight. He's nearly gone down twice now, however, both times from being off balance. Now it's Marciano moving in, throws that long right hand. He missed again. It was another wild right hand by Marciano.
Marciano landing a left and a right now, and the challenger back into the ropes there. Marciano following him, and Lestar says he has frequently in the fight, ties Marciano up in a clinch. Again, Goldstein, the referee, moves in, tells the boys to break it up. Marciano steps back reluctantly, finally steps in. He tries again with a hard right to the side of the head. Now it's Marciano punishing the challenger with a series of left and rights to the head, to the body. And again, Lestarza is beginning to move on. Again, Lestarza begins to look a little bit tired. Again, Lestarza is hurt by that series of blows landed by Marciano on his body and also his head. Not too much bleeding from that left eye, but we're looking for it. And Marciano is using it right now for a good target. He sets his sight on it. Lestarza moves out of the way. Marciano moves in on him, ties him up in a clinch. And now a right hand to the body by Marciano in that clinch causes Lestarza to winch just a little bit. Lestarza fights back with a left to the side of the head, another left to the side of the head. Marciano's head bobs, but he keeps on coming. Throws that right, stops it in midair, pulls it back, shoots the left. It misses the mark. They're tied up in a clinch. This is the eighth round of the polo grounds. And now Rocky hooks with his left. He snaps Lestarza's head sideways with a hard, short, but very powerful right hand. Lestarza. Moves out of the way just as the bell ends round eight. Has been threatened uh, with a finish in the last two rounds as Marciano has punished Lestarza. Seemed like he had Rollin in trouble a couple of times, but Rollin managed to weather the storm and finish on his feet. There have been no knockdowns in the fighters yet. There's the bell, round nine, coming up now. Rollin Lestarza versus Rocky Marciano with the polo grounds in New York. And now Lestarza moves out. He jabs with the left hand. Rocky again punishes the challenger with both hands to the body. A right to the body, another right to the body by Marciano. A short left jab to the body by Marciano. Lestarza tried to tie him up with a clinch, couldn't tie up either hand, and it's Marciano shooting another right to the midsection now. And Lestarza, instead of clinching back, off. And it's Marciano moving in on him. This time Lestarza, as Marciano throws that hard right hand, ties him up in a semi-clinch, and Marciano slams a hard right to the body. Managed to work that right hand free in the clinch. Now it's Marciano landing a very vicious right to the body, and he misses with two more follow-up rights. Lestarza moves back in, lands a very solid right to the side of uh, Marciano's head, one of the better uh, blows he's thrown in the last three rounds of this fight. But still, it didn't seem to have too much effect on Marciano. Now Marciano comes in and he hooks that left hand. And Marciano hooks another left hand to the midsection and Lestarza seems to be hanging on. Marciano's the stronger and now he's battering both hands to the body. Lestarza is backing away. And again, Rocky is moving in, throwing that hard right, throws it once, misses, pulls it back, throws it again, misses, tries with the left, misses, Lestarza. Even though he is hurt, even though he has slowed down a little bit in this fight, still has a remarkable instinct, and as we said before, is in splendid physical and mental condition, and manages, even though he is hurt, to get out of the way of those hard, fight-ending type of blows which Marciano was throwing at him right now. Now it's Marciano following up on Lestarza, catches him near the corner, throws a long overhand right that whistles through the air, lands on Lestarza's head, jokes him a little bit, Lestarza moves to his left, Marciano stalks him, throws the left to the body, catches him with it, and now Rocky moves in and lands a very hard left to the head. It made Lestarza's head bob a little bit. Lestarza ties him up in a clinch, breaks the clinch, moves out of the way. Rocky lands the left to the side of the head, and he misses with that right hand. He's thrown that right about a hundred times tonight, and he's missed a lot with it, but the rights he's landed have certainly made up for all the blows that he's missed. Lestarza. Seems almost helpless along the ropes now as Marciano moves in, batters him with two hard rights in the midsection, gets a left in return to the face. An instinctive left with not too much wallop behind it. This is the ninth round at the Polo Grounds in New York, and Marciano is landing now almost at will. The crowd is making a lot of noise up at the Polo Grounds here now. Lestarza seems weak all of a sudden in the last 30 seconds. Lestarza has become very, very weak in this battle. Marciano seems to be walloping him at the head and the body almost at will. And Rocky is landing hard right to the top of the head. Lestarza is in a semi-helpless position, and there goes the bell. The ninth round is ended. Lestarza comes out as the bell rings now. He comes out with what appears to be certain defeat. Rocky lands a hard left and another right to the head. Now Lestarza counters and then catches a hard right to the head. The challenger is bleeding at the mouth. He's bleeding at the eye. Rocky throws a hard right hand, and he slips and...
Rocky throws a hard right hand, and he slips and falls in Lestarge's corner, picks himself up. Lestarge's game, he's dead game, he's fighting back with what he has, but he hasn't got much left. Now he throws a left, now he throws a right hook to the head. Marciano shakes him off, keeps coming. Now he catches him with a short left to the face. Lestarza is staggered. He looks slowed down. He isn't uh, 80% as fast as he was earlier in this fight. Now Marciano moves in and walks right into a very solid left jab to the face. You've got to give this Lestarza credit. He has a lot of heart. He's taking a tremendous amount of punishment here, and away he goes, just punching with all he has. And now... Well, stars will lands another left of the head, but this time the punch doesn't carry any power to amount to anything at all. He ties up Marciano in a clinch. He's trying his best, but now it's Marciano moving that right hand loose again. Drills with a hard right to the midsection. Jolts him with another right to the midsection. Now a left high on the head, and Lestarza shakes his head, moves into a clinch, keeps on trying, and Marciano is trying to put this fight away right now here in this 10th round. Now Rocky Hurst rolling with a hard left to the head. Now Lestarza's face is a real bloody mess. It's a real smear. His eye is bleeding. His mouth is bleeding. His nose appears to be bleeding. And he's going to be a pretty sad sack. No matter how this fight comes out, he's going to be a pretty sore, bruised up boy for quite a while, starting with right now. And now Rocky backs away, moves in and slams a hard right uppercut, aimed at the midsection. It caught the midsection. Lestarza, however, is uh, for some reason or other able to handle this blow, whereas the rest of the blows thrown by Marciano in the last three rounds to the midsection have hurt him funny. Now Rocky's right, hits Ronald on the shoulder. And now he punches with a hard right to the top of the head. Lestarza again goes into that clinch. It's a maddening clinch so far as the Rocky Marciano handlers are concerned because surely by this time they feel that Marciano should have this fight. This is the 10th round. It's drawing to a close a matter of seconds before this round is over. And now Rocky moves in again. He hits Lestarza on the shoulder. And there's the bell ending round 10. More of the Rocky Marciano, Roland LaStarza 1953 title fight from the Polo Ground still to come. See how The Rock finished him off with a relentless 11th round assault in his second defense of his heavyweight crown. Then Marciano meets Ezard Charles, whom he called the most courageous man he ever fought. You're watching Ringside, undefeated on ESPN Classic. Marciano, fresh as the daisy, comes out very fast. Even though the stars have had only a minute to rest, he still looks a lot fresher than you might expect him to, considering the punishment he's taken. Of course, that could be a, uh, a misconception on our part, too, because it's very possible that one more wallop by Marciano will put the stars back in that helpless uh, very weakened condition that he appeared to be as he started off for the 10th round. Now it's Marciano coming out fast. Lestarza moving to his left. Marciano throws a left to the side of the head. Lestarza jabs and backs away. Then he clinches. They're still clinching. It's Goldstein moving in to break them apart. And Marciano, weaving and bobbing, chases Lestarza now. He cocks that right high, bores in. He trades left and right to the head with Lestarza. The crowd is beginning to roar now. They're beginning to really feel the beginning of the end of this fight. To the left of the head, a right to the side of the head. Drills a right downstairs to the midsection of Marciano. Marciano just keeps on coming. No backward steps. And now, Lestarza catches a hard right to the side of the head. Now Marciano moves in, throws the left, and throws another right to the side of Lestarza's head. And Lestarza's knocked halfway through the ropes. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's up at the count of nine. He's helpless, he's staggering, he's semi-conscious, he's on his feet, but he is wobbly. And Goldstein steps in, the fight is over. Ruby Goldstein has stopped the fight, and it's Marciano with a knockout over Roland Lestarza in the 11th round at the Polo Ground. The time, 1 minute and 21 seconds of the 11th round. For the first time in his life, Roland Lestarza has been knocked out. He was not off his feet. It'll go into the books as a technical knockout. So that is the Ring Magazine 1953 Fight of the Year. And that's the rematch. So how much better, Bert, is Rocky Marciano the second time around against Lestarza? 
these were winging punches. He, I mean, and they're landing. These are not just in the airs. In the beginning of his career, they were just throw it and hope to hit. Now he's throwing it and almost knowing everyone is going to hit somewhere, somewhere, mm -hmm. not necessarily how much on the button. How much more accurate is he here, Lou? He's getting more, more and more accurate. He's getting more, I've been using the word confidence. He's getting more confident. Mm -hmm. He's getting closer to the opponent. Uh, he knows what he's starting to do. But you made a point before about him hitting everywhere, and, and what was he doing with, to La Starza? Uh, I mean, what did he do to he, His arm, he almost ripped his arm off. I mean, all the veins and everything. He ripped everything off of there. He had an operation on his arm, his shoulder, everything. He couldn't move. He couldn't move. He was really? done. He was done. Needed an operation after this fight. That's just right. Pounded that's on the right. That's wow. right. I mean, you know, you bring your arms down, you, you can't defend yourself. I mean, you saw the, the, the finality here. He was just finished. hitting him every year. He was a finished fighter here. That's now. right. And which the, one? The, Both the, of them are finished. And, no, and, no. Uh, he, <laughs> see, Brian, a piece of sculptor, he would say, that's done. Charlie Goldman would say, that's done. Put it in the front window. You know what Charlie Goldman? Charlie <laughs> at this point, I think he's yeah. title defense. He's in the front window. Yeah. Charlie Goldman, he's in Macy's window yeah. at this point. <laughs> Charlie Goldman always said, a good fighter is like putting a quarter in one pocket and taking a dollar out of the other. Right. This is a, a, he just put a million dollars out of his other. Not only that, in this fight, you can see Rocky Marciano. Nobody's going to beat him. There is such a, there is such a time in a fighter's life, in that kind of a fighter's life, nobody's going to beat him. He had that determination, and he had it through his mind and his body that he wasn't ever going to lose. And that's, that's something going for the fighter. Especially if you have the uh, the Absolutely. other equipment. Absolutely, that, that's why, uh, Bill, you said the right thing. Confidence. And yeah. he had the confidence factor over there that he knew when he went in that ring, it was going to be a tough fight. He trained hard, and he was going out there. Uh, it, let, let me say, if he fights in a bar, he becomes a head, headweight champion of all the bars in the country. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's a style. He just, at this style. point, he doesn't feel he could ever lose. No. Nope. No, uh, Luke, how, how was how was Rocky after a fight? Like, did he have to come down slowly, or was he snap, change, no, he regular guy? No, he, he was he was social. I mean, he uh, I mean, when you come in there, come in the dressing room or anything, it didn't mean nothing to him. I mean, hi, how are you? Take a picture, kind of no, no. I mean. It was this guy was a man. He was in the ring and out of, out of the ring. All right, so now uh, coming up next is Ezra Charles. So Ezra Charles and Jersey Joe Walcott, they've been going at it at this point, and that's going to be the next title defense. But first, talk about Ezra Charles, Bert. Well, remember after Lewis retired, Walcott and Charles fought in an eliminator to decide his, his, his successor. And Charles wins. And Charles wins a rematch. And here comes a third fight, and it's in the Dapper Dan charity event in Pittsburgh, and the Roonies are running it, Pittsburgh Steeler owners, and Ezra Charles for heavyweight championship, we'll, fight, we'll, we'll give, Joe, give Jersey Joe another chance. It's a payday. The payday turned into a heck of a day for Jersey Joe, and if you look at this left hook, this is the reason why the left hook is viewed as one of the great punches and, the, and great levelers in boxing. That's because it's a short, short punch. You notice, I was just going to say the same thing. You notice he threw him about six inches out, and he's walking into him. That's the, that's the power. You that's throw the power. a left hand from here yeah. to here. Not going to have it. No, no power. No. From here to here, it's that's, all there. And Charles says he never there. saw it. I, I just, just, yeah. if, if of course he never saw it. If you had to see a perfect punch, a perfect combination, that was it. That Bad was style it. matchup, though, for Rocky Marciano taking Ezra Charles? Yes, I would say so. I think that those were his toughest fights. Even the one he he had a win because of the split nose. Yeah, no. See, Charles, Charles is a very good fighter. Absolutely. Very orthodox fighter. Very to the book kind of a fighter. You read, he could write a book on how to how to box. It wasn't exciting. That was the that was trouble. And he wasn't a big big puncher with heavyweights. Mm -hmm. But he had the style to beat Marciano. And, and to add to his potential greatness, and I view Charles as a great fighter. He was. His trainer, Ray Arcel, said that even now, at this stage in 51 and then on into the middle 50s, you could see the beginning, the traces of the disease that would later claim his life, Lou Gehrig's disease. Yes. In hmm. Charles. Really? Which makes him all the greater for putting up those two right. great fights. With Marciano. That's an excellent point. Ray Arcel okay. was a good friend of mine, and he told me he loved Ezra Charles like a son. 
Great. Stage is set that Ezra Charles, again, uh, heavyweight champion from 1949 to 1951, tries to become the first man to regain the heavyweight championship of the world against the unbeaten Rocky Marciano. Let's pick it up. Yankee Stadium, where Rocky Marciano is ready to defend his world heavyweight championship against former champion Ezra Charles. This is the biggest fistic battle of the year, and the setting is just about perfect. It's a cool summery evening with nearly 50,000 fight fans inside the huge ballpark. General Douglas MacArthur is here with General John Reed Kilpatrick at left, president of Madison Square Garden. The lady in the center there is Mrs. Ezard Charles, wife of the challenger. Giant manager Leo DeRocher and his wife Lorraine Day are also ringsiders as announcer Johnny Addy makes his introduction. Main event, 15 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world presented by the International Boxing Club, James B. Norris, president. The principals introducing from Cincinnati, Ohio, wearing white trunks, weighing 185 and a half, the challenger and former heavyweight champion of the world, as a Charles, Charles, and his opponent from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing black trunks, weighing 187 and a half, heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano, Marciano. Thank you, Bill Coram. Good evening, everyone. Both are short with left lead. Marciano blocks the right, crosses the left, throws the left hand high on Charles's head, goes into a bob and a weave. They go to close quarters again. Ruby Goldstein watches them. They clinch. They struggle around on the inside near the ropes without tying each other up. Now they break without being told. They're at long range now. Marciano leaning a little bit to the right. Takes a sharp right hand that grazes his chin and partly on the body. Goes to close quarters. On the inside, Charles holds it the left hand, rips away with the right hand of the head. Marciano pushes his man away from him. They're at long range now. Charles throws a long right hand under the heart. Marciano struggles into a clinch, rips a short right hand of the body. Again on the inside, Charles rips that right hand of the head. Now they're at long range again. Marciano takes the light jab, a hard right hand of the body by Charles. Charles seems to be concentrating on right hands to the heart so far, and it's early in the bout. Less than uh, just about two minutes to go in this round one of the 15 round. If it goes that far, they're in close again. And Charles rips away with the right hand before he, he breaks the clinch, comes in with a hard left hand of the body. Uh, Marciano takes a short right chop on the chin. The pace has not been too fast now, but Charles has been carrying what little there has been of the fight so far. Charles paints the left hand. Marciano moves in on his man, takes that right to the heart again. And Marciano on the inside puts a left chop to the chin. A short right to the jaw thrown by Charles. They come out of a clinch. A hard left hook on the chin, and Marciano wobbles a little bit. Marciano was hurt a little bit, but Charles does not take advantage of it. Charles rips the long right hand of the ribs as they move in close. And Charles on the inside takes a short right hand of the ribs shown by Rocky Marciano. Marciano bobs and weaves a little bit, moves in on Charles. Charles paints the left hand, so does Marciano. Marciano in a, a crouch throws a right hand that goes wild over the head. Charles chops away with a left hand on the chin. On the inside, Charles rips away with a short right hand of the head while holding on with the left hand. Then he pushes the champion away from him. The, cha the challenger, Ezra Charles, leans a little bit to the right as he comes on in. Now it's Marciano moving into a clinch without throwing a punch. And Charles very easily tying him up near a neutral corner on the rope. Just about a minute to go here in round one. Marciano moving in on his man. Both boys seemingly in good condition, and Marciano has weathered that early storm, apparently. He moves into a clinch. The champion has done very, very little so far here in round one. He has done little but clinch and try to throw a, a right hand on the inside. He has not thrown a long right. He goes in, and Charles rips both hands to the head. Marciano pulls his way into a clinch, throws a left hand that winds around the neck of Ezra Charles. Marciano is starting very slowly. Charles dance up and down. Marciano deep down in the crowd. Moves in, throws a right hand that lands suddenly on the chin of Ezra Charles. And Charles is holding on, but Charles fights back. Ripping a right hand of the jaw as he comes out of a clinch. A right by Charles goes over the head. And Marciano misses the left hand, then grazes the chin with another right hand. Charles stabs him a left hand on the chin, rips hard to the body with a hard left hook. Charles is boxing beautifully so far here in round one, the bell. More of the 1954 Rocky Marciano, Ezra Charles title fight from Yankee Stadium ahead.
The Cobra connecting with an array of shots that open up a cut over the champion's eye. This would be the only Marciano title defense that would go the distance. Then it's the old mongoose, Archie Moore, sending Marciano to the canvas. Left hook to the head, and Marciano goes down with a straight right hand to the nose. And later, Burt Sugar explains the tragic circumstances of Rocky's death in 1969. You're watching a Rocky Marciano marathon on ESPN Classics Ringside. This is Ringside on ESPN Classic, a Rocky Marciano marathon. The Rock went 23 rounds against Ezra Charles in their two title fights. Both of the historic bouts action-packed. Let's get back to Yankee Stadium for round four. Round four it is. Marciano's left hand of the body is blocked by Charles. They immediately go to close quarters, struggle around on the inside. Ruby Goldstein, the referee, says all right, and they break. Marciano, short left, a hard left hook to the jaw. Another left hook to the jaw by Marciano as he suddenly opens up on Charles. Charles stands there without a return. Looks a little bit serious now. He throws a short right to the head, takes another left hook, another to the head thrown by Marciano. And a third as Marciano is gripping that left hand to the head again and again. And he is counter with a short right to the jaw. Marciano takes the left hand. Charles backs away. Here's Marciano coming in desperately trying for a knockout. Charles back towards the rope, takes another left hook to the jaw. And on the inside, Charles rips that right hand to the jaw. Marciano keeps pouring in. Marciano is cut around the left eye. He's been seriously cut around the left eye. The blood is pouring into the optic. He takes a shot right to the jaw by Ezra Charles. Charles on the inside, rips away with the right hand to the jaw. Marciano moving in on his man with about two minutes to go in the round. Let's see what happens about that cut now. Marciano puts the left hand to the head. Marciano was carrying the round by a wide margin when he was cut around the left eye. It's bothering him. He's trying to brush away the blood. That will do him no good. Marciano is really bothered now by that left eye. He whips the right upper cut to the jaw by Charles. It hurts Marciano. Marciano swirls into a clinch. He is hurt. No question about it. He goes into a clinch. Marciano takes the left hook and a straight right to the jaw by Ezra Charles with about half the round to go. Charles puts that left hand to the jaw. Marciano bleeding badly around the left eye. Starts in, tucking the right hand. Takes the right hand of the body, thrown by Charles. Charles is carrying the fight now. He sweeps him with the left hand of the body. Marciano is winding up with his punches now. He's moving in on his man. Charles, supremely confident, dances into a clinch. Falls in close. Gets away from the right hand by Marciano. Marciano's left eye is not bleeding as much now as it was earlier. He misses the left hand, gets away from the left hand by Charles. A minute to go on the round. Charles hurts Marciano with a straight right hand of the jaw. Then rips the left hand of the head. Marciano in trouble, goes in and holds on again. The champion in real trouble, but he smashes the left hand of the body. They fall in close. Charles rips the right hand of the head. Now they're at long range again. Marciano's left eye is starting to bleed all over again. Charles keeps his left hand up high, throws a straight right hand of the jaw. Champion on the way in, and this is the worst round Marciano has had since the first round fight with Waltz had a couple of years ago. Marciano backing towards the ropes. Now he starts in, tucking the right hand. Charles ties him up as he moves in close, then pushes his man away from him. Charles digs a fierce left hand to the body, nabbing Marciano on the way in. Marciano moving in on his man. Here's Charles straightening up with a straight right hand of the jaw, whipping right hand by Charles. A short right to the head, another one in there by Charles as he ties up Marciano on the inside. The round is almost over now, seconds to go. Marciano takes another right to the chin by Charles, and there's the bell. Marciano looks for an opening, takes a jab, and a short right hand of the jaw by Charles. Charles shortens up with the right hand and plants it on the chin again. Takes the right hand of the body by Marciano as they maul on the inside. It's been a good hard fight, a clean one all the way. Charles misses the right hand, takes the left hook to the head, and one to the body by Marciano as they struggle in another clinch out in the center of the ring. There's Marciano bleeding around the left eye again. He takes the short right hand of the chin, smashes the solid right to the jaw. Of Ezra Charles, right up a to the jaw by Marciano. Left hook to the jaw by Marciano, another right. He's got Charles in trouble and holding on. He finds the right to the body, a left hook to the chin, another left to the head. 
hit by Marciano. A left and a right to the jaw. Charles is trying to cover up. He takes a sweeping left. Another left hook to the jaw by Marciano. A right to the head. And a straight right hand to the jaw. And Charles is in trouble. He takes a left and a right to the chin. A left and a right to the jaw by Marciano, who is trying to pull this fight out. Charles is in trouble. He takes a left hook to the chin. Half a round to go. A minute and a half yet to go. Marciano ready to wind up with a punch. Next to the right hand is Charles. Marciano hooks the left hand of the chin. Charles fights back gamely with a right uppercut to the jaw. Takes the left to the body, a right to the body, a right to the chin by Marciano, who is unbridled fury now. The abysmal brute. Two left hands, a right to the chin. Charles is staggered. He takes the right to the body, a left hook to the chin, a wild right to the jaw. Another left to the chin, a right to the jaw. A right uppercut that misses. Another left hook to the jaw by Marciano. And Charles comes back with a left hand on the chin. I don't know what's holding Charles up. He takes another the right to the chin, he rolls away from the left hand. Marciano smashes the right hand to the chin that makes Charles hold on again. Charles takes the left to the chin. Uh, Charles misses the left, takes the left to the chin. Charles smashes the right, and then the right, and left hook to the jaw by Charles. And Charles is putting on a fierce rally here in round six. Marciano moving in, Marciano bleeding around the left eye, misses the left hand over the head. Scores with the left hand of the jaw that makes Charles hold on again. Marciano plants the right hand of the body. Marciano puts the left hook to the chin. Charles takes the right uppercut to the jaw. Charles won't go down. He takes another right to the chin by Marciano. Marciano puts the left to the chin, a right uppercut to the jaw. As is Charles is a game, game fighter. He fights him with both hands to the jaw. Charles scoring with a left and a right to the chin. Marciano plants the right to the chin. Charles goes out staggered. Charles, a right to the chin, misses the left hook. Takes another left hook to the jaw by Marciano. A right uppercut to the jaw by Marciano. Marciano starts with the right hand of the rib. Charles is still full of fight. He won't go down. He takes the right uppercut, a left hook to the head by Marciano. A right uppercut to the jaw by Marciano. And there's the bell. Stay tuned for more of the grueling 15-round world heavyweight title fight between Rocky Marciano and Ezard Charles. Bert Sugar, Bill Gallo, and Lou Duva will return for blow-by-blow -blow analysis of the bout. This is Ringside, the home of historic fights and the stories surrounding them, only on ESPN Classic. Charles and Marciano, Charles in a half crouch, takes a left hook on his head, but he partially blocked it. Marciano feigning in the left hand, throws a left hook on the chin. Charles counters with a hard left hook to the chin. Charles scores with a solid right hand to the body. Marciano coming in, ever trying for a knockout to last, uh, land one of those detonating punches of his, throws a right hand to the body, it's partially blocked. Marciano moving in on his man, both boys in superb condition, no question about it. Charles, a fierce, passing left hand to the body of Rocky Marciano, and no return by the champion. Big hard with a left and a right to the body as they flurry and a hard flurry with honors about even. And Marciano scored with a long right hand to the body. Marciano, a fierce left hook to the chin, a solid right to the jaw by Marciano. Marciano scores with a right to the body, digs the left hand to the body, and Charles himself scored with a right to the chin. Marciano, a right to the body, a left hook to the chin. Marciano is throwing them in punches, not caring whether they land or not, but he's throwing them in there. He's coming in on Charles. Charles puts out a jab, puts out another. It's short of the mark. Marciano straightens up and then he straightens up Charles with a right up a cut to the chin a right to the head Charles takes the right hand to the body less than two minutes to go on the round a solid right to the chin thrown by Marciano and Charles has been in trouble a couple of times but every time he seems on the way he fights back gamely and bitterly and well Marciano winds up with a right hand and Charles just pulls his head back in time but he then takes a left hook to the head Marciano goes in close Charles ties him up on the inside Charles thanks the left hand here's Marciano coming back Back to the attack now with half the round gone. Marciano scores with a left hand, a whooping right that hurts Charles. Charles is staggered by the right hand, staggered by a left, staggered by another right. He lays it down. Marciano winding up with the right hand of the chin. Charles is woozy. He takes the left hook to the chin, takes the left hand as the left hook to the jaw. Charles is sitting up, but Marciano can't find him. Charles uh, puts the right hand to the chin, misses the left over the head. Marciano puts that left to the chin, drives the right hand to the jaw. Charles in trouble, takes the right to his body thrown by Marciano. Marciano pounds the right hand to the chin, a left hand to the jaw that staggers Charles again. Charles is game, he's fighting, but he's weary. He takes the right other to the chin. Well, 45 seconds to go on the round. Mar 
Marciano winds up with a right hand in the front. Stalls is staggered again. Marciano hooks the left hand of the jaw, but it's wide of the mark. Marciano comes in, drives the right hand of the body. Charles backs away. Takes the right to the chin. A left hook to the jaw. Another right high on the head by Marciano. Marciano hooks the left hand on the chin. Charles will let go down. He is staggered by a right other cup, but he puts his Marci Marciano away. Marciano rips that right to the jaw. He winds up with a right and a left hook to the chin. Charles tries a straight right hand to the chin that hurts Marciano. Marciano is hooked with a left and a right to the chin. Marciano drives the right hand of the body, takes the left hand of the body of Ezra Charles. Marciano misses the right hand over the head and comes in with a left hook to the jaw at the bell. Bill. Few expected Ezra Charles to hang with Rocky Marciano, but the former champion was true to his old form. For 10 rounds, he withstood the brutal Marciano right hand and was answering back effectively, especially with the left hook. Marciano's stamina and will was tested to the limit, but it was a test the fearless champion accepted and passed. On this night, Marciano transformed from a relentless battering ram into a gladiator. And like his fabled Roman ancestors, his fury was fueled by the roars of the crowd. We'll have more of the mayhem when the Marciano Marathon returns here on Ringside. We return here to Gleason's gym. Lou Duva is here. Burt Randolph Sugar, Bill Gallo of the New York Daily News is. Uh, we put him to work. We put you to work here on this right. show. Yeah, Do a little right. Rocky Marciano for us, and yeah. you can show us. That coming up. We're going to get to the 15th round uh, as well. But first, from what we've seen so far, uh, incredible work rate, Bert, again, of Rocky Marciano. Again, through 14 rounds going after Ezra Charles. He's a nonstop punching machine. I mean, I still don't see great science there, but I see great, great punching <laughs> power. He is throwing punches at you almost. Don't need science. And I was just going to say the same thing. You're supposed to be drawing. Keep drawing. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, he just he keeps punching. He looks like Nolan Ryan throwing fastballs. And you know what? Some of them are getting there. You know. Oh, I'm not. You know. And also, I'm I'm going to give some props to the gallantry of Ezra Charles. Absolutely. He was a hell of a catcher. <laughs> I mean, the battery, the battery, the battery tonight is Marciano pitching. And as Lou says, yep. Charles catching. Uh, Lou, there's a repertoire here where now he's throwing, he can throw uppercuts, he's throwing not just winging Absolutely. hooks, of course, Absolutely. but, he's, but exactly. when he gets in, he throws what's, what makes whatever, sense. Whatever he can hit, the, anywhere he can hit the guy. When he gets close, he uh, uh, gets in, that, they're, that they're closer to, to his body, then he starts throwing them up. He starts throwing them up. Lou, would he come into camp and in that, was he... Was he Superbly conditioned, uh, not, I wouldn't say nobody is naturally, but did he have it in him or did he work so hard in camp that he got to that point? I think he worked he so hard in camp. That's a, I mean, he came down in good shape, you know. Right. Because he used to do a lot of exercises back home, playing ball with all, with all the people up there. But I think when he came into camp, that's when everything was all business. All and, yet, and yet Charlie Goldman told me once that Marciano loved as much as boxing to eat. Training. Yeah. He mm -hmm. loved to eat. Oh, he, said, yeah. he said he'd find bananas under his pillow at night he had to take out. When he'd go out to eat with him, he'd, he'd have, he'd, first he'd cut his, his steak into small pieces so he'd take it easy. And then he'd help himself to anything on his plate to keep him from eating everything and the plate. Yeah. He used to train in the Grossinger's airport. They used to have a little hangar. Yeah. And that was his, and he used to hire Leone's chefs to cook for him. Pasta every night. I was there several times where he let me sit down and have a couple of plates of pasta. But what I, what, what I had in my mind watching him train, never stop, never stop. Charlie Gomez said, okay, Rock, take a break. And nope. I'll tell you what, if you go up to camp and you say, well, I'm going to watch Rocky train, at the end of the workout, I think you, you, need, a, you need a massage and then you, you need you got to get rubbed down because you say, how the hell is he doing? Right. Well, let's get to I'm, getting, I'm getting tired just watching him. Just really, very quickly, Charlie Goldman on massages, they once asked him, have you ever massaged Rocky Marciano? He said, nah, good fighters don't need it and bad fighters don't, don't deserve, deserve it. it. Right. Yeah, you, you talk to Charlie too. Right. The, uh, right. the conditioning is phenomenal. The work rate is still there. Right. Even in round 15, it would only get better. Let's pick it up, the final round. The 15th and final round, and few thought it would go this far, but there they are, battling away for the biggest title in Fistiana. They go to close quarters, no damage done so far. 
Marciano's left is wide of the mark, and he takes a left hook to the chin, a right to the head thrown by Charles as they maul their way into a clinch. It's hard to tell how they're going to judge this fight, so this round is all important. Marciano scores with the left, goes a straight right to the chin, a left hook to the jaw, another left and a right to the body by Marciano. Marciano misses the left hand, scores with a jab after taking a jab, takes a right to the head. Charles has been hurt time and time and time again, but he would not go down. There have been no knockdowns in the fight. Marciano coming in now. He's been bothered by the left hand. He's game. There's no question that both are as game as any fighters who ever fought for the heavyweight title. Now they're at long range again. Marciano takes a grazing right hand to the jaw. Marciano throws a left hook to the chin, and Charles holds on for a moment. Marciano moving back to the attack. Charles feigning the left hand, not throwing it for a moment. Charles takes a left and then a short pumping right to the body by Marciano. Less than two minutes to go in the fight now. We're in the 15th and final round, and Marciano faces a bloody mess, no question about it. Charles is marked two. He throws a straight right hand to the jaw of Marciano. They go in close. Now they're at long range. Here's Marciano coming in with a grazing right and a grazing left hook to the chin, putting a short right to the body, a left to the chin, a passing right to the chin. Marciano coming back with a left and a right to the chin, a left hook that staggers Charles again, and Charles fighting on nerve, digs the left to the body, makes another left and a right to the chin, another right by Marciano, goes over the head, he misses the left. Charles is wobbly, but he holds on. Marciano is fired too. Marciano comes in, throws a left and a right to the chin. There have been no knockdowns in the fight. Marciano throws a right high on Charles' head. A minute and five seconds to go. Charles puts both hands to the body. Marciano puts the right to the body. A left hook to the jaw as they come out of the trench. Another left, a right high on the head. A short left to the mouth. Another left, a right to the body thrown by Marciano. A left hook to the chin, a right to the jaw. Now throws a wicked right hand to the body. And they fall in close. Marciano puts the right to the body, a left to the body, a right to the chin, a left and a right to the jaw, another left and a right to the jaw. Charles is staggered, but he will not go down. He staggered again by a left and a right on the chin, a wild left, another right to the chin, a left and a right to the jaw. Half a minute to go in the fight, another left by Marciano. It's all rocky now. He starts a left and a right to the chin. Charles takes the right upper cut, takes the left, takes another right, takes the left, and Charles the way he's staggered by a right. He almost goes down. The rope pulled him up. He takes the right and the left of his jaw. Marciano is unbridled fury here in the 15th round. Charles holds on. It's almost over. When you hear this crowd yell, Marciano hooks that left on the chin, drives the right to the chin, but he cannot get Charles off his feet. It's all over. All over. And they throw their arms around each other. And well, they might. Because two more game or gallant fighters never fought for the title. Did they, Bill? No, sir, Don. They never did. Here is the decision. Judge Carol Barnes scores it eight, six, one even, favor of Marciano. <laughs> Judge Ali Idala scores it eight, five, two even, favor of Marciano. Wait a minute. That was Ruby Goldstein's vote. Eight, five, and two, even. His judge, Adi Idala, scores at nine, five, one, even. Favor of Marciano. Women by unanimous decision. And still, the heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. So Rocky Marciano gets the win in uh, losing, though. Ezra Charles is gaining new admirers and causing some boxing riders to reevaluate his fortitude. This is from Arthur Daly of the New York Times, who wrote at the time, quote, A brave and gallant man is Ezra Charles. He didn't have to take the punishment he did. From the sixth round on, he could have taken the easy way out. No finger of scorn would have been pointed at him if he had gone down and ended it. Critics have accused him in the past of making prudence his cardinal virtue. But Charles fought to the finish on his feet rather than on his shield. Guys, you took a real pounding in this fight. That was Absolutely. an impressive round 15. Absolutely. But what are your thoughts on Ezra Charles then, Lou? Uh, he was a great fighter. Let me tell you. That. I remember he was a light heavyweight, and then he moved up, you know? He was a light heavyweight. And, uh, originally. And, and, the, and the punches that he took were phenomenal. I, I could, I, you know, we couldn't believe that he would take that many punches. At this point, he was the second best heavyweight in the world. Absolutely. Not just because of his showing against Marciano, but because he was. 
And, I mean, Walcott's retired. Uh, who else is there? It wasn't a great heavyweight division at this time. Uh, I think it was Jimmy Cannon who said, and it was probably because of the mob influence at the time, Rocky Marciano stands out like a rose in a garbage dump. But boxing needed a Marciano at this time because it really didn't have much else. You know what, Bert? It needs it now, too. Yeah. Oh, good. It, needs look, it, look, it, look. Always, it always needs it. There's always somebody that comes along to right. so-called save it. And that's what we're Joe Lewis. Right. But save it was Marciano it. in this era. Absolutely. Yeah. Up, 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 up in the... You know, even, and we, we, you brought out the name uh, Evander Holyfield, and so I think younger fans can think yeah, of the work rate of Holyfield. He, he didn't right, but I'm it. just saying work rate, though. I'm watching that yeah. in the 15th round. And, I, you know, I don't know, even, you know, Holyfield, Bo, I don't know if they had Fury. Certainly, they didn't go 15. Was a great but fight. That, but, right, great even, fight. but that's a, the work rate there on the one side with Marciano was incredible for the 15th 12 round. round. 12 round. And if you remember, last couple of rounds between Holyfield and, uh, and, uh, Redding Bow, it was toe to toe, toe to toe. And that toe. tenth round will go fight. down in that first fight. That's right. When he can, uh, if you had, had to get anything as close to a fight like you just seen right now, that was the one. All right, just three months later, though, after this one, and uh, this was a slugfest, Rocky Marciano and Ezra Charles would face off again. It wouldn't be for the squeamish. Marciano Charles, too, uh, with the uh, bad nose injury for The Rock. We're back right after this on Ringside. Rocky Marciano. This is cut. Oh, can we see the whole? Hold that up there, Pokey. Yeah. That's hold the that cut. Up. See, that's the cut. Oh, yeah. okay. Great. I'm going to get a cut. In my opinion, that Rocky Marciano was, was a technical fighter. He wasn't. I can compare him to a street fighter with a huge heart. And uh, he never lost. And Marciano misses with the left hand as Charles digs to the stomach with the left and then gets his right hand free for the moment and they tie each other up with Marciano trying to get his left hand free and Charles cupping away up the air with the right and then banging to the midsection with the left hand. Burial does not break them and they fight their way out of it out into the center of the ring here at Yankee Stadium. As a Charles slipping a light left hand thrown by Rocky Marciano and Marciano goes right away to close quarters and Charles spins him away with the left hand. The right hand whistles all over the head. Uh, Rocky Marciano with 30 seconds left here in round one. Charles tying Marciano up. Marciano charging with a short left uppercut as Charles is moving away. Out of the center again with uh, daylight between them. Marciano goes inside. Charles misses a wild left hook. Marciano misses a short left chop and sends it for the jaw. Charles scores with a combination. The left hand of the body, the right cross to the jaw. And Marciano pounds away at the midsection as he fell into an immediate clinch. Referee Al Burrow breaks them up. Charles shoots a short left jab to the forehead at the bell. There's the bell, and out they come. Rocky Marciano, the heavyweight champion of the world, and Ezra Charles, the challenger from Cincinnati. Rocky lands on the top of Charles' head as Charles came into the crowd. Now Charles with a combination, a left to the jaw and a right cross to the forehead. Marciano pounding away at the midsection, and Ezra Charles ties him up. As Rocky was falling in, Charles chopped him on the left jaw, but uh, there was very little steam behind it. Now Marciano. Lambs hard to the midsection. The fans thought that the blow was low, but there's no warning from Al Burrell. Now Charles with two left hooks. Marciano staggers him with the right hand high on the forehead. Marciano's after him. Charles is in trouble. Marciano and Charles is down on his hands and knees with a minute to go, but he's up. He's up immediately. And uh, here they go. He strikes the right hand infected as Marciano goes for the forehead and misses with the right hand. Thrown very high. Ten seconds left. Rocky Marciano misses with a long right hand as Charles bounces away, apparently full of pep. Charles now lands on the right ear of the challenger as the bell ends round two. And ready to go. Rocky Marciano did something in round two that he couldn't do in 15 rounds the last time they fought three months ago. And Ezra Charles appears to be fresh and confident once again. Marciano going after him with that powerful left hand as Charles tries a left uppercut and misses. And Marciano comes in, stinging him with the right hand on the cheek but missing with the left hook. Charles with two snappy uppercuts on the infighting forces Marciano's chin back. Marciano inside as Charles misses with the right hand thrown for the head. Rocky, a very difficult man to fight because he's always moving in on you and falling in, so about all you can hit is the top of the head. Marciano looking Charles over here in round three at Yankee Stadium. Charles with a left hook to the forehead and a right cross that landed on Marciano's jaw. But it seemed to do no damage. Now Charles trying to punch straight up as Rocky and Marciano comes into the crouch, goes for the midsection, and uh, does very little damage. Rocky having a little bit of difficulty breathing from a blow that landed on his nose early in round two. Marciano going into the left hand for the forehead, then goes into a crouch, brings up a right hand under the heart. 
and tries a left hand for the four that was blocked. Marciano throws a sneak right hand once again to the left ear of Ezra Childs. Childs does not return. Childs bounces away, keeping his gloves high now. Marciano down low, almost on the floor as he comes in on the crowd. And here's Marciano with a left hook to the head that's partially blocked with the right glove of Ezra Childs. Childs stabbing away with a feeble left hand at another one, trying to keep the champion at bay. Marciano stalking across the ring, landing three left hooks to the head and a right cross. And Childs leads him down the ropes as Marciano is trying to take contact at him. But he is missing due to Charles' wonderful ability to weave and bob. A great defensive fighter. Marciano had about six clean shots, and he missed them all. Fifteen seconds to go in round three. Charles with a left hand under the heart of Rocky Marciano. Marciano with his gloves very high now as he comes in, and he swings for the head and misses. Charles with a left hook and a right cross to the forehead, both very light. Here's a straight left for Ezra Charles. Marciano tries to pin him against the rope. More of the Marciano Marathon motoring on. Stay tuned as Rocky recovers from a terrible cut and goes after Ezard Charles with a vintage rush. Later, the Brockton blockbuster takes on British heavyweight Don Cockell at Kizar Stadium in San Francisco. The challenger withstanding an amazing flurry of punishment from the champ. Welcome back to ringside in the rematch between Rocky Marciano and Ezard Charles. It's round four from Yankee Stadium, September 17th, 1954. And despite the knockdown in round two, Charles appears fresh. His punches have been slow tonight, but uh, so far he has not come across with that uh, fine left hook that we know he possesses. He misses with the right hand as Rocky Marciano comes out and throws the left. Now Marciano goes to work to the midsection. As a Charles tries to tie him up and bounces a left hook off the champion's chin. Here's Marciano with a left hand downstairs and a fine left hook high on the head of Ezra Charles and he follows it up with another one that's blocked. Charles falls away with two feeble left jabs, comes in with a left hook partially blocked by the rock. Now they go into the clinch in the center. Rocky Marciano tries to battle his arms clear. Referee Al Burl is there to separate him here in the fourth round for the World's Heavyweight Championship. Charles misses an overhand right for the head of Marciano. Marciano working inside, brings up two left hands to the midsection. Charles one right hand to the chin, all very light blows. Marciano after Charles once again. Charles misses the right hand, brings up the left uppercut as Marciano missed his left also. Marciano moving inside now, trying to flail away at the chin of Ezard as Ezard blocks his blows beautifully. Tied him up briefly, out of it they come. Marciano with two left hooks to the chin, springing to the attack. Now a right hand down to the midsection. Charles trying feebly to tie him up once again as Ezard so far has not done too much punching and Al Burrell tells Charles to come on and fight. He's the referee. And again, as that's all there was to hit the position that Charles was in. Marciano misses a right for the head, goes in with a left hook on the jaw, another left hook on the jaw. Marciano after Ezra Charles now, who's uh, just using the left hand to try to keep the champion at play. Marciano misses a right hand for the head and scores with a right hand. High on the forehead of Ezra Charles. Back they go now. Marciano trying to figure him out. Charles beating the retreat. Here is Marciano inside with the left hand to the right ribs and a good right hand by Marciano that staggered Ezra Charles briefly. Then he fell in the clinch with less than 15 seconds to go here in round four. Here's Marciano missing both with the left and a right, blocked easily by Ezra Charles, and a long right hand with the midsection, lands partially, then in Charles' own corner. Ezra Charles with five and a half pounds on Rocky Marciano, 192 to 187, and here is Marciano landing a high left hand on the forehead. Apparently, Rock has been told to step up the pace. Ezra hoping to win the title back and fighting a very cautious battle so far. Here's Charles with a flicking left hand of the nose and another left hand of the nose of Marciano. And as Charles misses a right hand, Marciano springs to the attack and pounds away at the midsection of Ezra Charles. Here's an attempt by Charles to bring up his right hand in uppercut fashion, but it's blocked by the champion from Brockton, Massachusetts. Here is Marciano inside again, trying to fight his right hand free. His head is snapped back twice with short uppercuts by Ezra Charles, and Marciano pounds away to the midsection, trying to bring down the guard of Ezra Charles. There's been a terrific amount of infighting in this one, much more so than in their first bout uh, three months ago. Marciano with his mouth open, another sneak right hand by Marciano, Charles going away, the blow skidded across his left jaw. Here is uh, Marciano with a short left hand, and then he gets his right hand free and bounds, bounds away with the right hand for the midsection, but Charles isn't there. 30 seconds to go in round five. Charles with a right left to the forehead. Marciano with a right hook for the head, and Charles with a left hook and a right cross. Marciano comes back with a stinging right hand on the left jaw of Ezra Charles. Charles moving away, and Marciano scores with a long left hook and a fine right cross, and Charles breaks out into the open, looking at Rocky, not uh, doing too much about defending himself, and then he suddenly goes into the clinch as he tries to tie up the Rock from Brockton, Massachusetts. Here's Marciano going down low now to get his right hand free. And uh, the round five is over. Keep talking, but here's round six and Russ Hodges. And Rocky Marciano, with that Ezra Charles on the floor in the second round, comes out. Al Burrell talked to both corners. He probably wants more action. 
Charles misses with a left hook high for the head. Marciano comes in, and Charles swings for the body and, and connects, and then uh, chops away at the jaw of Rocky Marciano with the left. Charles is missing with his right consistently now. His left hand has been his most efficient weapon as Marciano stalks him. And the rock comes inside, weaving and bobbing now. Goes with a short left hand to the forehead. Ezra Charles with a very feeble left jab scores twice, then crosses his right hand as Ezra has not been able to set any kind of a pace so far tonight. Here is Marciano with a left hand for the head, another left hand partially blocked as Rocky Marciano springs in on him, but Ezra Charles goes into the clinch immediately. Charles at 192 and a half, Rocky Marciano at 187. And uh, Marciano, from the effects of the blood, is blinking a bit as some of it got in his eye. He misses with the left hook and uh, tries to throw with the right cross, but Charles is going away, and he misses another long right hand as Charles is backing away. 15 seconds to go here in round six. It looks like the tip of Rocky Marciano's nose is split a bit, the very tip of the nose. Marciano tries to score with a long right hand. It was partially blocked. Charles goes inside, ties him up again, then Marciano fights the right hand free. And that ends round six. Marciano seemed to have the fight well in hand when he suffered an unusual cut in the sixth round. As Charles came out of a clinch, his elbow hit the champion flush on the nose, splitting the Marciano proboscis. After the fight, Marciano graciously called the incident an accident. But in the ring, the cut produced a furious flurry of action from the Brockton blockbuster. We'll see Marciano's response to adversity, the vintage barrage of heavy Marciano artillery, when we return. This is ringside, Rocky Marciano on ESPN Classic. You're watching Ringside, undefeated, a Rocky Marciano marathon. Rocky fought the guys they put in front of him. That's what any, any fighter could do. You fight the guys they put in front of you. And anybody, everyone they put in front of him, he knocked out, he destroyed, or he beat uh, handedly. So, uh, you know, you're talking about Ezra Charles, who was a great fighter in his own right, was a great light, one of the greatest light heavyweights, move up and be a lot, became a great heavyweight. The first fight, they had, you know, 15 rounds, Rocky was rough and tough. What did he do? Turn around, fought him again, knocked him out in eight rounds. So, you know, uh, Rocky, I certainly think he proved his point against any of the opposition they put in front of him. It looks like a deep cat scratch right down the front of Rocky Marciano's nose, extending all the way down to the tip, and they put salve on it to try to uh, stop the flow of the blood as they come out, and Ezra Charles jumps immediately to the attack. It has uh, bothered Rocky a bit. He continues to paw away at the nose, and he looks like right now a Halloween character with that yellow stuff uh, smeared over his nose. Marciano with another left hand down into the solar plexus of the boy from Cincinnati, Ezra Child. Marciano circling, fainting with the left hand, doesn't throw it. Now he shoots the left hand straight in. Ezra Charles ties up his gloves. Marciano is spun by Ezra Charles, who tries the left uppercut, and it's very light. 15 seconds left to go in the seventh round. Here's an exchange of fine right hand as the bell is about to sound. Right up above our front through the microphone. Charles staggers away from the effect of the left hook and a right cross high on the head, and the bell ends round seven. All right, we return here to Gleason's Jim Burt. Uh, how bad was it for Rocky Marciano going into the eighth round? He was behind on some scorecards, but even more important in the seventh round, he had suffered probably the most bodacious cut in the history of boxing. I mean, this was a split right down his nose. Right down the nose. In fact, he comes back to his corner after the seventh round, and he, he feels, as he later relates it, that he's breathing not through his nostrils, but out through his nose out through the sides of his nose. Mm -hmm. And he asked Al Weil in the corner, can you get me a mirror? I'm just, you know, and, and he said, no. He said, I want a mirror. P.S. After the fight, he goes back to the dressing room, sees himself, and he faints. He said, I literally had to sit down. And the problem was the referee had given him just one more round. It was such a severe cut. Here's that round right now. Let's take a look again. Round eight. Can Rocky Marciano pull it out? Tom Tannis uh, yelled from the corner about the stab that they're putting on the nose of Rocky Marciano. And now Charles lands with a hard right uppercut, and Marciano goes right to work and snaps his head back with a right uppercut of his own. That nose must be very painful. It's a deep, scratch-like wound running right down to the tip of the nose, and once again it starts to bleed. Charles trying to move inside after the very brief flurry here at the start of round eight. There, now there is a laceration over the left eye of the heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. And Ezra Charles, moving back flat-footed, moves in now with a right hand under the heart of the champion. Rocky, moving into the attack, tries to bring his left hand up for the head of Charles and misses as Marciano 
is tied up again by Ezra Chow. Their heads are coming together so frequently that undoubtedly it's damaging both boys. They get their heads right down together as they try to slug it out of the infighting. Charles goes to the left and the right to the midsection. Rocky Marciano now is tagged with a right hand over that left eye, which is starting to open up. Then Charles is tagged with a right hand coming in. Two minutes left to go in round eight. Marciano with the left hand very high, tries to move in. Charles backpedaling, and Charles goes into the infighting and landing just one light left hand to the midsection and pushes Rocky Marciano away. As Marciano's face now resembles that of a gargoyle as Charles lands hard to the midsection and then tries to tie up the champion and then snaps up a right uppercut, working steadily to the head of uh, Rocky Marciano. There's a stain on the left cheek of Ezra Charles. I don't know if it's a cut or not. We'll have to see. It might be some of the blood from the champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. Marciano falls Charles away now. And that, well, that was no cut on Ezra Charles. Here's Marciano with the left hook to the body. The right cross to the head. He misses the long left uppercut. Charles with the left hand to the forehead. Marciano with the right hand to the body. And a solid left hook right on the nose of Ezra Charles by Rocky Marciano. Charles backpedals, takes in a deep breath. Gets his hands up high. Marciano throws the right hand. For the left jaw, and we saw Ezra Charles' eyes blink. Then Marciano bounced the midsection, but they were blocked for the elbow. He misses the head with the right hand. Charles staggering the hook with the right hand, and Charles is down with the right hand. It's getting four, five. He's up anyway. Burrow, Burrow did not get a count. And here's Marciano, like a tiger, swinging across the ring, landing with the midsection, getting his right hand free, chopping away at the head. Another solid right hand, and a left for Marciano, and a right hand on the back of the neck. Charles is down. Thrilling to watch once again. Uh, th there's clutch hitting for you, Lou. Your thoughts yeah. on Rocky um, coming back? My clutch hitting. When they asked me who was the greatest fighter in the world, it's only one. Rocky Marciano was never defeated, and uh, the way he came back and the way he fought people. I mean, uh, he was in there to fight. Period. He was in there to do anything else. Bill, it looked like it was the end of the line for the champ at this point. Well, yeah. Well, he had to knock him out in that round. That's I'm right. They were going to stop that fight. Let me tell you the story about that cut. And Bert here will not interrupt me because I, I, I have, I, I stand behind my friend Ray Arcel, who told me this story late in his life because Charlie Goldman told it to him, who was in the corner. They had a thing called Munsell Solution. Yeah. Munsell Solution hardens like cement immediately he put that in Rocky's nose so that it wouldn't split more wouldn't bleed more the trouble with that is right after the fight they took him in an ambulance he had to go to the hospital immediately operate him because it would become poisonous so hmm. they took it right out and that's Marcel solution won the title for Rocky he, he, Charles was gonna win that fight in oh. that round, if they if he didn't do it, that's another that's another great fight where a great trainer saves the fight. Uh, here, here, here goes a household commercial compliment no, to the trainer. No, no, <laughs> no, it's true. No, that's, you know, well, uh, helped make it possible uh, for Rocky uh, to save the day because he great. delivered that shot. But more on the nose then. First, though, no, Marciano wouldn't fight again for six months. Again, very unusual injury. Let's take a look. Uh, this is Sports Century. We did a profile of Rocky Marciano and uh, talked about this injury at length and how it almost stopped his undefeated record. As for this coming fight on the 15th, I'm sure glad to be meeting Ezra Charles again because I've always improved a little bit on the second time around. In their first meeting in 1954, Marciano retained his title in a unanimous 15-round decision. But a savvy Charles had Rocky on the ropes in the rematch three months later. Charles had the classic style, the classic movement, and uh, strong. He was a strong guy. Rocky had an outstrong the guy, outsmart the guy. He had a vicious fight with him. He was as close as he ever came, closer than he ever came to losing in that fight. Charles had hit him with an uppercut and cut the, the nose. It was a rare type of a cut because it went up his nose. Marciano's nose has been split into two ribbons of flesh and his handlers have covered it with a Pinocchio-like bandage. It looked like someone had taken scissors. 
and there's this big gaping hole, and the blood is pouring down. And when Rocky came back to the corner, everyone was sure the fight would be stopped. I said, Rocky, you're going to lose this fight if you don't knock him out. The referee is watching the cut very badly, got a bad cut, and that put an additional fire under him. His face looked like it was a bleeding piece of meat, but he, um, he soldiered on. Rocky said, please, give me one more chance. It's not bothering me at all. For whatever reason, the doctor gave Rocky one more round, probably because he was the defending heavyweight champion. Marciano knocked him out in the eighth round, retained his championship. He said the first thing he did, he ran downstairs to the locker room, opened the door, went to a mirror, and he said he almost fainted. I get sick. I mean, I saw his nose, and when I tell you that it was just literally split, you could actually lift it up like that. Of course, Rocky said it will heal, and there'll be no problem. Um, he took everything lightly. It was one of those defining moments when you look at your big brother and you say, he's invincible. The head falling apart, the arms coming off, he just would not stop. This is what the world champion is. This is Rocky Marciano. Oh, well done there. What do you think, Lou? What do I think? How bad was that nose? How bad? You didn't look at bad. that nose? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the doctor giving him one more round really meant something and... Uh, and uh, like I say, at the end of the round, if, uh, if he don't knock him out, if he don't knock him out, he's in trouble. I think they stop the fight, and he might have got a loss. But um, like a great fighter, he comes back out there, and he knows he's got to knock this guy out to win. Oh, like an all-time great, yeah. great fighter. Yep. That's what a great fighter does. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill has something I, for you here. With, with the injured nose intact, the, the cartoonist, again, has Well, I was the talking about you made this, Bill. Louis? This is for you, my friend, since you were a friend of well, Marciano's. Now, look at that. Look I at that. demonstrate the cut there, right there. Right. right. The one that one cell solution was put. Look, even his brothers didn't even know that the one cell solution was in there. Steve, but it was. He's even autographed it to you. I was, if he didn't sign it, I was going to put it. Give me the that, thing. Give me the thing. Pablo Picasso. Before, before you, you score another lose. <laughs> Rocky Marciano, again, yeah. uh, oh, wins an all-time all great win over Ezra Charles. Now he's done with Ezra Charles. He'll move on. We're going to take a break. Up next is Don Capel, 1955. So the champion still undefeated. We'll see him in action when we return. Welcome back to ringside, Rocky Marciano. Prior to his 1955 title fight with British champion Don Cockell, Rocky Marciano had defended his heavyweight belt four times, winning three of those fights inside the distance. It was Marciano's first fight since he had been badly cut on the nose during the rematch with Ezra Charles. He showed no after effects in the showdown with the Englishman. Cockell hails from the Battersea section of London, and a battering is what he got from Marciano. Nice to meet you, Don. Did you have a nice trip over? Good to trip. Thanks. Marciano came in in a ski suit. The weather cool, like an October evening rather than one in May. And it's just as cool as the cumbers tumbler right now. Looks the champion to our left, and Cockle standing there. And here's John Dunphy in round one. Thank you, Winelli. Good evening, everyone. Cockle goes to the champion with a light left to the head. Rocky grabs and they hold on for a moment. Now they're at long range. Cockle faints the left hand, goes into a crash, steps under a left hand, rips the light left hand of Marciano's body. On the inside, the champion puts the right hand to the rib. They clinch briefly. Now they're at long range again. Cockle faints the left hand, faints it again. He looks dirty, takes a long jab to the head by Marciano. On the inside, Cockle holds on to the ref's left hand, then pushes him away. Cockle faints the left hand. He's a little bit shorter than the champion. He puts a light jab to the head, a light left hand to the body, ducks away from the left hand, put out by Marciano. Marciano fighting out of a half crouch, now straightens up. Marciano faints the left hand. Cockle puts a light right to the body, misses a sweeping left hand over the head. Cockle dances up and down, about 25 seconds remaining in round one. Marciano's light jab goes to the head. He hooks lightly to the head with the left hand, misses a long sweeping left at the head as Cockle backs out of range. Marciano moves in on his man, stabs away with the left, takes a light jab to the head. Marciano's looked a little bit sluggish so far. He puts a light jab to the head, takes a right to the body. Only a few seconds remaining in round one. Cockle puts a light jab to the head, misses a left, and takes a solid right hand to the jaw by Marciano. And a right up a cut that grazes the Senate round the bell. Here's Don for round three. 
Round three it is, and the British challenger is giving a good account of himself. He puts the light left hand to the body of Marciano. Marciano moving in on his man, takes both hands to the body by Cockle. Another grazing left hook on the jaw. Cockle puts another left to the head, and is hurt by a hard left hook to the jaw by Marciano. Marciano first trouble right to the jaw, and Cockle has to fuss. hold on for a moment, but he dances up and down. He's a sturdy battler in there. He paints the left hand, works the right hand of the body. Marciano crashes home the right hand and lands on the body, on the breastbone. Cockle at long range. Takes a right up a cut to the jaw by Marciano, who is starting to find the challenger. And with hard, devastating punches. Cockle puts a light jab on the chin. Marciano's coming in on him. He cocks the right hand. Just above us, it's Cockle with a light right up a cut to the jaw, nailing Marciano on the way in. Marciano, a light jab that goes wide, and Cockle misses both hands as Marciano goes deep in the crowd. Marciano faints the left hand. Cockle stands there, comes in with a hard left hook on Marciano's head. The Rock takes it without a return. Cockle sticks out a left to short, takes a hard left hook to the jaw by Marciano. And Cockle again takes that punch well. Just about a minute to go here, another left hook to the jaw by Marciano. Cockle takes a grazing left hand to the body and ties up Marciano on the inside. Marciano lifts the right and is countered with a hard right to the jaw by the challenging Burdisher. Marciano takes another right high on the head, goes in, leading with his head, and Cockle sends him off. Cockle dances up and down, puts a light jab on the nose. Stays away from Marciano. Cockle is boxing a little more in this round. Puts a light left hook on the jaw of Marciano. Marciano grazes the two of the right, misses, and takes the right to the jaw, and then Cockle misses the right hand at the head. Cockle out in the center, dances up and down. About 30 seconds to go in the round. Marciano puts a light left hook to the jaw after missing a jab. Cockle thinks the left hand, backs away at long range. Here's Marciano coming in with a long right to the head, and is counter with a short right to the jaw by Cockle. Cockle dances up and down, takes another left hook to the jaw, but again rolls with the punch. Breaking the force. Only seconds remaining here in round three. Scheduled for 15 in San Francisco. Marciano moves in with a long left hook with Daggers Castle. He is hurt on the rope. He takes the right to the body. Tries to hold on. That left hook fell to him. But he fights back with a left hook to the midsection himself. Puts another left hook to the jaw. Slugs with Marciano at the bell. Round six. Round six it is. They get out there quickly again. Marciano sticks out a left, takes the left to the body, and fires the left hand that's wide of the chin. Marciano out of the half crutch is up to the short right to the head. A right hand to the body by Cockle, who has finally started to work on the body. Marciano himself puts a solid left hand to the midsection. Cockle up on his toes, dances around, comes in with a left to the body. Left hand to the head. It drives the right hand to the jaw, but almost turns Cockle around. Another left to the head by Marciano. And in between, Cockle smashed back a right to the jaw. The crowd came up roaring that time. There's a long right to the head by Marciano. And they are trading in a real pier sixer here. Marciano backs into Cockle's corner. Missed a well right hand over the head. That would have been it in the grinder, but it didn't. There's a left hook to the jaw by Cockle. A left hand to the body. Cockle fighting back with a right hand to the jaw. He has hurt Marciano. Now he knows he can hurt him. And Marciano sprawls in the middle of the corner, ripping a right to the body. A left hook to the body by Marciano. Marciano coming after his man, puts a jab on the chin. Cockle, a left hook to the jaw. A challenger having a good round here. In close they go. Marciano fires a right to the body, a left hand to the body, and takes the left hook to the jaw by Cockle. Cockle dancing up and down, takes a long right to the head, puts his arm right to the body, digs the left hand in the midsection, fires the right hand on the jaw. And the crowd will come up roaring when this one ends. Cockle coming after his man now. Faints the left hand. Marciano, a jab on the nose. Cockle pushes him away. Marciano missed with a long right fire at the head. Marciano is ripped with both hands to the head. Cockle is staggered by a right to the jaw by Marciano. A left hook to the jaw by Marciano. But Cockle goes in, holds on, now backs out of there. And the blood is streaming down his forehead. Marciano, a light left hand to the head, only a few seconds to go in this round. Marciano, a solid right, a left hook to the body, another left to the body, a left hook to the jaw, another jab on the chin by Marciano. Cockle takes the right to the jaw, Marciano bangs the mask to the bell. More of the power of Rocky Marciano ahead. See the rock in full fury as Cockell is saved by the bell in round eight of the 1955 World Heavyweight Championship by the Bay in San Francisco. Marciano takes the left side. Then it's back to Yankee Stadium for another Hall of Fame matchup. Marciano versus Archie Moore. Don't miss the old mongoose becoming the second man to drop Rocky to the canvas. This is ringside, only on ESPN Classic. So it's May 1955. Don Coquel taking on Rocky Marciano and Burt in San Francisco. So he's branched out, leaving Providence, le leaving yeah. New York. This is only the second time he's ever fought outside the Eastern Seaboard. And it ain't going to hurt him here, I'll tell you. Don Cockell, 
an average heavyweight. He might be the British and Empire heavyweight champion. Mm. He had been a fair to middling middleweight. I like to say that, middling middleweight. Uh, I'd fought some good fighters and over the hill Randy Turpin and won. I'd lost as many as he won and then moved up to heavyweight and was undefeated as a heavyweight. And still they made fun of him in the British press because he was a dumpy little thing, they thought. And yet, to read the British press, while the American press is saying it's two to one he doesn't show up on, on, uh, on fight night. And, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that would save this to go six rounds is because the boys are doing it for the pictures. Uh, he puts up a, a, a relatively, I think, gallant fight. That was the British word. But he's getting hit everywhere. Now, getting hit everywhere is important to the Brits. I mean, these are people who love to put up with uh, wonderful stands, whether it's the charge <laughs> of the light brigade or whatever. And they're saying that Marciano is dirty. He's breaking every rule in the book. He's hitting him behind the head after the bell when he's down. What they have never seen is Marciano, as Lou pointed out, in action, because he just throws punches. He doesn't care what you, you got the bottom of your feet up, he'll hit those. But to them, this is uh, the Marcus of Queensbury, it's not. And Coquel, who has promised to stay with him, and the one thing he's promised is to go after his nose, because he doesn't believe it's repaired. Lou, I wanted to ask you that. What's the thought in the camp at this point? for that nose that was so badly damaged months before. They were sweating it out. They really were sweating it out but because they didn't think this guy would be that tough, you know. And like Bird just says, he went after his nose and uh, that's, they're taking advantage of everything. They You're did. always going to go after a guy's that's nose right, though, right? right? I mean, they're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's the yeah, idea, yeah. right? More so, more so. When you know the nose try to tap him. You're try to tap him if you can yeah. and touch him there. Um, but that might have been his Bar only game. hope. That might have uh, been his only hope. Uh, yeah. yeah. You talked about the, about the British. Uh, uh, howling about fouls and all that stuff. They were howling because uh, when Rocky missed, I mean, they couldn't understand how come the guy was even taking a bunch of I mean, he, he, he was, I mean, but everything was a foul to them. If he hit him, it was a yeah. foul. Behind you know, but, the head, after the bell, uh, below Bert, the, the, the waist. Bert, you, when you break this down, though, and this is coming between two marvelous for performances against Ezra Charles, and then still to come was Archie Moore, where he was great. So here, wh what do we say about this night? That Rocky wasn't quite at his best, or that Coquel on this night, 205 pounds, really put up a very good fight? No, he didn't put up a good fight. He was a, you know, he was a, a, a fungal ball. Uh, but I think that he had a chance if he basically went after the nose. Outside of that, no. The nose didn't nose, so he didn't go. And what happened was Don Coquel really didn't put up much of a battle. It was that easier fight between two very hard fights with Charles mm -hmm. and the one coming up which he doesn't yet know will be extra hard against Archie Moore. Yeah. It was a, it, it was a, like a fight like before a fight in training if you saw Rocky Marciano hitting the back for maybe three four rounds mm -hmm. you know that's what kind of a fight it was nobody was punching back I mean and all that was Rocky was, was teeing off teeing off. I mean the, the, I think the best thing that Kakel has done is still be there come the fifth round. Which there's something to be said for. However, I mean, Kakel Marci is gone at, at this point. And but, but Marciano, right, is not as ferocious. But right, you'll see frequently there's a the fight in be. between. Yeah. It's I mean, not going to be the same. Thing. I mean, Marci Marciano's basic basic line was about his whole style: Why waltz for ten rounds when you can knock him out in one? But that one goes to the ninth round ninth again. Round. Rocky Marciano. Gets the knockout he was looking for. There'd be one more. He'd be looking for Archie Moore after this. So when we come back, again, it's classic ringside. Rocky Marciano, one last fight. We'll have that with the old mongoose, Archie Moore, the all-time knockout king, after this. Today, that Rocky Marciano, the heavyweight champion of the world, has agreed to defend his championship against Archie Moore at the Yankee Stadium on Tuesday, September 20th. I'm glad that the time has finally come when I can, when I could accept the fight with Archie Moore. We all know he deserves it, and uh, I think you're going to see a great fight on that day. Do you feel, Archie, that uh, you can knock Marciano out? Of course, he never has been. Well, that's always the first time. Uh, I remember one time 
I thought that I couldn't be knocked out, but I have been knocked out too. Mm -hmm. So Mar Marciano is, is human like anyone else, I suppose, and he can be knocked out. So the light heavyweight champion of the world gets a shot at the heavyweight title. We welcome into Gleason's gym, former two-time heavyweight champion of the world, Big George Foreman. How are you, George? Doing good. Happy to be with you. It's good to have you here, George. All right, so Archie Moore was in your corner for part of your career, but what are your thoughts on Archie, the all-time knockout king, as a fighter? Great fighter. Probably one of the greater fighters of all time. He had this magnificent defense. Even moved up in weight. He started off even as a lightweight fighter. Moved all the way up into fighting heavyweights. Even dropped a heavyweight or two in his time. So the guy was one of the greats of all time. One of them. Now, of course, the records. This is fascinating, Bert. Where Marciano is 48 and 0. Of course, he would go to 49 and 0. Moore is 148 and 19 and 9. That's a lot of ring experience to bring in. <laughs> I got to tell you, when I was editor at Ring Magazine, we put out the Ring Record Book, and one day Archie came into the office. So I handed Archie Moore a record book and I said, Archie, are there any fights in here? And there were 100 of them and 50 of them that we don't have, that you know of. So he takes the book, he goes over in the corner, comes back in an hour, he had found five. <laughs> Three wins, two losses, so he wasn't just patting it. <laughs> but the most interesting fight was the first one in 1935. His opponent's name was Piana Mover Jones. There's a name if I had heard in the ring, I'd have been out and... Uh, <laughs> you don't want to fight the piano there. mover, right? <laughs> but Archie had a lot of fights and was um, a very, very great ambassador of the sport. But he campaigned for this fight against Marciano. It was a, it was a PR approach. You know, Marciano doesn't want to fight me. I'm light heavyweight champion. He's scared of me. He even took out ads in newspapers. And every time there was a reporter sitting in front of him, he would talk about... Marciano doesn't want to fight me. So he really put himself and pushed himself into the position of this fight. Teddy, your thoughts on Archie Moore? Very smart man, the old Mongols, uh, philosopher type man. Very thoughtful about what he would say. Very proud about how he would speak. Uh, very, very cerebral. You know, always about the mind. Uh, as George said, defensively, you know, he created the turtle defense where he crossed one hand over the other and a great, great puncher. You know, he had like 142 knockouts. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to have that many knockouts, are you kidding me? Uh, but he would set up the punches. You know, this was a smart man. This was a guy who really studied the game. Do we get a skewed view, Bert, of Archie Moore, given that if we watch a lot of these tapes, a lot of times it's, it's Archie's shot at the heavyweight title, later with Floyd Patterson. Do we get a skewed view of, of his career? I say this with a general person sitting on my left, George Foreman. He was not the first to prove that 40 was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. Archie Moore coming into the Marciano fight was either, either 42 or 45, nobody knows. Because he claimed he was born in 1913, his mother claimed he was born in 1910, and Archie one time being asked about it said, I've given this a lot of thought and I had, I've come to the conclusion that I was three years old when I was born. <laughs> so Archie Moore gets his shot at the heavyweight championship. It would be Rocky Marciano's last professional fight. Let's pick it up and start with round one. Here are the principals introducing from San Diego, California and Toledo, Ohio, wearing black trunks, weighing 188 even, the light heavyweight champion of the world and challenger, Archie Moore. Moore. His opponent from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing white trunks, weighing 188 and a quarter pounds, heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. Marciano. 15 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world. And here they come, Archie Moore in the black trunks, Rocky Marciano in the white, both boys just a half pound apart. And it's uh, Moore trying to pound to the midsection and tries to tie up Marciano, and Harry Kester's right there to break them with only one light blow being struck. Here is Marciano coming in and hooking to the head and missing, and Archie Moore ties him up but can't tie up the right hand. It pounds to the midsection twice. They get their heads together out of the center, both protected nicely. Moore with a straight left to the nose, comes in once again, tries to get his right hand free, and Rocky's got that tied up. Rocky pounds to the midsection with his right, 
and sends uh, Marciano uh, away with a straight left to the head. Here is Marciano missing the right as he goes in. He brings up a short left uppercut that skidded across the chin of Archie as Archie backs away. Now Moore brings up a short jolting left uppercut to the chin of Rocky Marciano. Both boys uh, fighting very conservatively here in round one. And round one is over. Cool at Yankee Stadium. Both boys shed the bathrobes and come out for round two. Marciano trying to go for the head. Moore covering up beautifully. Here is Moore landing a short left hand into the head. Now Marciano comes in much closer. Apparently uh, going to try to wage an inside fight as Moore leaves and bobs, moving away. Marciano with one right hand to the midsection of Archie Moore as Archie was backing away. Moore misses a short, snappy uppercut to the head. And Marciano puts Moore back on his heels with a left hook to the head. And Marciano goes down from a straight right hand to the nose. Moore has his left hook blocked with his right hand, lands on the chin, and now Marciano is back with a left and a right, and a left and a right all of the chin of Archie Moore in their landing. They're standing toe to toe. And there's the bell. Stay tuned for more ringside Rocky Marciano. Frenetic action in round four as Archie Moore remains standing after a storm of Marciano swings. Marciano hooking all the time. Classic will also cue up one of Archie Moore's last interviews. The old mongoose remembering his brawl with the blockbuster. Archie Moore was so good that in the final days, boxing days of Joe Lewis, he integrated Archie Moore's style into his repertoire. That's how good Archie Moore was. Uh, Archie Moore never did integrate Joe Lewis' style into his. Archie Moore is that good that you'd watch him and learn from him. And Marciano puts Moore back on his heels with a left hook to the head, and Marciano goes down from a straight right hand to the nose. He knew Archie Moore could punch. The hardest right hand he ever got hit, he always said, was from Archie Moore when he got knocked down. All he heard was a count of four. And that's how he says, I couldn't believe it. He said, I got hit with a right hand, I'm down, and I hear the referee say four. Here's number three. Moore comes out quickly. Marciano, hands pretty high. Hooks toward the head. Moore with that elbows and arms defense. Faints to the left, gets caught with a left hook on his chin. Rocky Marciano misses the jab, gets hooked on the inside. Moore places the punch as well, blocks the hook with the right glove high in the air. Archie faints to the left, gets caught with the left back of the right ear. Rocky on the inside, bangs the left and right to the body, hooks to the head, and sticks a jab on the forehead of Moore. The light heavyweight champion, the challenger. Moore comes in with the right uppercut inside. Uh, the champion pushes him off there in the center of the ring. Archie Moore gets away from a wild swing, missed by a couple, three inches. Meantime, Rocky bending a lot, a la Jack Dempsey gets up with a good uppercut, bangs on his chin, a good left hook on, on Marciano's chin. Moore stabs and stabs again with a left lead. Archie Moore trying to set his man up, a good defense. Moore bends to the right. Marciano circles to his left little, slips the left lead. Archie Moore now sticks out a light left jab on the nose of Marciano. Marciano, with about two minutes more to go in round three, sticks out a jab. Rocky actually short with the right hand. Goes forward, moves in, wants the hook, and chops the right hand on the chin of Moore, who sticks out a stiff jab. Moore blocks the left hook with the right glove high in the air, jabs and jabs again to keep the rock off him. The rock with his back toward our blue ribbon microphones, right near his, in fact, blocks the left, gets caught with the right, and pulls his man off, pushes him off. Now I see Moore bending, keeping those hands, gets caught with a hook on his nose, and a right on his nose. Good punches by Marciano. And another wild right, just raised the jaw of Mr. Moore. Knees buckled a bit. Archie comes off the ropes with a hook on the nose of Rocky, and that nose is bleeding a little bit. Rocky bends to his right, comes in with a hook, gets covered with a one-two chop above the left eye. The left eye has a slight cut above it, above the eye. About 20 seconds to go as Marciano digs to the right of the body, hooks on the chin. About 15 more seconds in the third round. Rocky hooks and hooks again in close range, pushing his man back. Rocky now setting a good pace. Goes to left, goes to right. Hit shots all the way by Marciano. Only about five seconds to go. Left and right uppercut that time by Rock. Rock moves in. There's the bell, and here's Rock. Rocky Marciano found himself in that round, ladies and gentlemen. Archie Moore goes back to his corner rather slowly. Right jaw, Russ. The boys come out very quickly. Boys, I should say the men. Meantime, in close range, The Rock wants to stay in there and get those hands free. And the referee, Harry Kessler, doing an excellent job, has them at long range, but not for long. A jab, they exchange left lead. Rock wants to throw that hook. That's his best shot. And they exchange hard right to a good hook. Another hook off the chin of Rocky Marciano. A jab high on Rocky's head as Rocky goes in that Bob Weave style. Rocky wants to set Moore up, does to the right, misses the left. Rocky pins Archie Moore against the rope, bangs the left hook on his mouth, bangs the right uppercut on Moore's mouth, rips the right under Moore's left hand. Moore rallies with a left and pushes Archie off. Archie now, with a minute more to go, a minute to go in the round, 
Marciano fires one, two, three punches, all hooks. Stops the right on the skin of Moore. Moore against the ropes, leaning against that second rope. Rolling with punches, riding with punches. Gets out with a left, another left. Fired by Marciano. A stiff jab and a good uppercut by Moore. Another hard hook by Moore. A duty that time by the challenger. And a right on Moore's head. Rocky misses the right. Rocky misses the left. Rocky chops the right back of the left ear. Meantime, Archie Moore stays against that those ropes. And Rocky Marciano gets caught with a left on the chest. Marciano now gets caught with a left uppercut in close range. And Archie Moore just leans in, stays in, and misses the wild right hand. Archie Moore pushes, pushes Rocky off with a hard jab. Rock moves in, penetrating a little bit. They exchange left and a hook on the mouth of Archie Moore, who seems to have a cut with a hard right on Moore's jaw. The best puncher of the fight, I'd say. A left uppercut on Archie's jaw again. Archie now gets caught with a hook, partially blocked. He gets caught with a right, gets away from a left hook. Marciano hooking all the time. Press Hodges reporting now as Archie Moore, who had quite a rough round, comes out fairly fresh. Rocky Marciano right after him. And it's Moore trying to jab Marciano away. And uh, Moore staying out in the center of the ring for the time being. He's been going to the ropes very early. And there's Marciano forcing low to the ropes now. Moore lashing out with a left-handed short. The straight left lands, though. And uh, Marciano leaps after Moore and chases him around the ring. Marciano apparently trying to... Uh, Maneuver Moore back into the ropes and Moore staying out of the center as Marciano comes in and misses. A left hook for the head. Moore lands a left of the chest and another right that landed under the chin, not in the vulnerable spot at all. As Moore moves back now. Moore seems to be having a little bit of difficulty breathing. Marciano faints with the right, goes in with the left, then runs into a left hand of the chin, another left hand of the chin. Thrown with the challenge of Moore. Another light left thrown by Archie. Rocky comes in now. They almost butted heads as both boys got very close. Marciano digs to the body, brings up the left of the face, and it misses wildly. Moore with a one-two, the combination landing, but not too strong. Here is Marciano pulling his way inside. As Archie Moore leans away to the ropes now to uh, get away from Rocky. Rocky now missing the left uppercut, keeping the right hand very low, and he tries to swing the right hand and misses. Follows Moore across the ropes now, then shoots in a straight left hand to the face of Archie Moore. Moore. Now getting his right hand up to protect against the left hook thrown by Marciano. Marciano coming in very low now. Just completely powerful, even though you block his blows, a lot of the force gets through. Marciano runs into two straight left hands to the nose and another one from Archie Moore as the challenger backs away. Marciano with the light right. That ends the round. We'll be back with more of the 1955 heavyweight title fight between Rocky Marciano and Archie Moore. See in spectacular black and white film how the two legends slugged it out at Yankee Stadium. The old mongoose fighting to the bitter end as the younger champion hammers him down to the canvas in round six. Now Archie Moore scores with the right hand of the nose. Rocky Marciano puts it down. I thought that I could beat any man that I could hit. And, and Marciano was not too hard to hit. And I was outboxing him easily. But he came around. It was an awful bone-cutting jolt. When I say that, I say it as if though he was a great boxer. He was not a great boxer. He was just a hard hitter, slam bam. Didn't give a damn. This is a Rocky Marciano marathon on ringside. Back here in Gleason's gym, Brian Kenny, Teddy Atlas, Big George Foreman, and Burt Randolph Sugar. Let's go back to round two. Moore puts Marciano down. Only the second time that's happened in his career, Burt. Moore could hit. There was no question about it, as most knockouts in the history of the heavyweight division. He knocks down Marciano and always claimed that the referee, Harry Kessler, cost him the fight because he claimed, and George heard this story from him too, that Kessler took Marciano's gloves and yanked him to bring him two out of his days and then got between him and Marciano as he wanted to come in and finish Marciano off, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So it is important within the context of this fight that we're just not seeing more go down because Marciano has gone down too. What did Archie say, George? What he told me later that? on about this, uh, the, the referee uh, later on passing on and he had this bitterness for so many years between uh, Harry uh, uh, doing this thing, but later on, he said, I wish I had not, after the referee had died, he said, I wish I hadn't had so much bitterness, but it was too late then. Mm -hmm. Once someone passes away, you can get a chance to pat them on the back and say, we were there, we were part of it, 
but he uh, so he suffered behind that. Let's get to round six now. Again, we've seen a good part of this fight, but here's round six again. Marciano and Archie Moore. Teddy, let's get you involved here. Your thoughts on, you know, why is you know, Moore taking this beating from Rocky Marciano at this point? Well, first of all, his age. You know, he, he's not a young man. Yeah. He's no spring chicken, that's for sure. You know, this is a guy, it's funny, we're talking about how he was treated unfairly. He had a history of being treated unfairly. They didn't allow him to fight for the light heavyweight title. He was a great light heavyweight champion to 10 years past when he should have got a chance to fight for it. So he's doing extraordinary things with a young fighter here. It, what you can see him doing is staying on the outside, trying to get distance, and trying to time Marciano. He understands right away his best shot is to try to time Marciano coming in, but he just didn't have the reflexes anymore to pull the trigger on those punches. Hey, George, let me get into the other side here as we look at the power of Rocky Marciano. Again, you're one of the hardest hitters of all time. Your thoughts on Marciano's power? Well, Archie told me whenever he'd, he'd have a, a collage of films he'd carry around, he'd show fights he'd won, and then he'd have the uh, Marciano fight along with him. Hmm. I said, why would he carry a fight like that? He'd get beat. He said, this man, he'd tell it, oh, he hit you on the arms, and he hurt my arms so bad. That's the power of Marciano. Hmm. The irony is that George Foreman and Rocky Marciano have the highest slugging percentage of any heavyweight champions, the two of them. And, uh, you know, for Marciano, just, he'll hit you anywhere. He doesn't mm -hmm. care where he'll hit you. Moore was covering up, and he was really taking a lot of pain. This time, that little locks just didn't hit because the pain in his arms. He told me about that. Well, after your arms start to hurt enough, you're going to drop them and your chin is there. That's what he told me and, happened. And, <laughs> and, and just like Teddy said, where he has that defense in front of him, turtle-esque, or almost armadillo, as he called it, your arms are going to drop because they can't just, take it anymore. Your nerves, they start pounding on There's some nerves that go along the elbow or from the elbow down to the wrist, and they start taking a pound. And that's what happened to him. He and, told me, honestly. And, George, look at the work rate. I mean, look at the punch. I mean, you know, guys, look at the work rate from Marciano, where it doesn't stop. A machine. Yeah, but look, Moore is trying to, as Teddy said, come through with a right-hand counter every now and then. He, I mean, he's getting the pajabers. He knows that that's, that's his best shot, is to be able to time him in between one of those fat shots. And he's still trying to do that. But obviously, at this age, at this point, with this kind of young fighter who's just throwing punch after punch, he's not able to do that. He's not able to sustain it. And, you know, a lot of these punches early on will land like that one behind the head, behind the ear. You know what that does to a fighter? I mean, forget about the ones on the chin. You're hitting a guy behind the ears, throwing the equilibrium off. You're hitting him behind the head. As you alluded to, Marciano is hitting him in all kinds of unorthodox spots. In fact, in his previous fight against Don Cockell, the British writer said it was the dirtiest fight they'd ever seen because he hit him behind the head and the kidney. I don't think Marciano planned to hit you anywhere but everywhere. <laughs> and that was just, right, just yeah. to hit you. And, and that, was, that was a brutal, about, what, 45-second sequence that we saw there with an incredible work rate from Rocky Marciano. When we come back here, again, Marciano keeps on pounding. On the knockout came the old mongoose, Archie Moore. But Moore refuses to back down. We'll be back. This is Ringside. Rocky Marciano on ESPN Plus. As the Rock gets mauls and wrestles and moves Moore back, using his power, using his iron fist against the right heavyweight champion. A good hook on the mouth of Moore. This is a Rocky Marciano marathon on ESPN Classic. Coming up, Bert Sugar explains the tragic consequences of the plane crash that took the life of the ring legend in 1969. Classic will also roll out the snippets of the 1970 super fight between Muhammad Ali and Marciano, a computer making the decision on a fantasy fight that packed movie theaters across the world. Our ringside experts at Gleason's gym share opinions on who would really win between the greatest and The Rock. Now let's head back to Yankee Stadium. Round seven, Marciano versus Moore. Moore comes out quickly, a right to Marciano's body. Archie Moore goes forward, hooks to the midsection of uh, Marciano. Marciano now stands his ground flat foot, moves inside with a left uppercut. Marciano on the move, throws the right, throws the left, he's wild with each shot. Rocky, bombing away, gets caught with a left uppercut in close range. Moore cracks a good right, another right on the jaw of Marciano. Marciano just setting Moore up for the kill, misses the right-hand punch. Rocky works his way forward, moving in, and throws a wild left swing, throws a good uppercut into his jaw. Rocky walks into a stiff jab and bangs a right on the jaw of Archie Moore. Moore now cracks the right, Moore goes down to the right. Partially a slip, no knockdown. Kessler rules, no knockdown whatsoever. It's a slip. Meantime, Marciano goes forward, gets caught with a right, ripped under his heart. And somebody just yelled, slip my eye. Meantime, 
Monty Marciano working his way forward. Kessler ruled, no knockdown. A left hook on Moore's mouth. Moore sticks out three light jabs to keep the rock off him some way. Moore blocks the left hook. Moore now throws the right and was wild with the left hook. Archie doesn't miss too many punches, but the rock has the power. The rock has the iron fist. Rock working his way in, moving forward. Rocky stays in, cracks the right, gets cut with a good right on his jaw. They exchange jabs and Rocky Marciano with about 40 seconds to go in the round, works his way forward, moves in. Rocky now bobbing, weaving, bending in, pulling his way forward, throws a left in close range to over in Moore's corner as the Rock just mauls and wrestles and moves Moore back, using his power, using his iron fist against the right heavyweight champion, a good hook on the mouth of Moore. Moore now blocking the punches, rolling, rolling with the shot, sticks out a jab, throws an uppercut, gets caught with a left and a right to the body. Moore, meantime, with only seconds more to go in this round, throws a, a right uppercut, trying to pull the Rock off, but Rock will not be denied. Rock staying inside, hooks to the body, cracks the right high on the head of Archie Moore, throws the left uppercut that moves Archie back a little bit against those ropes. Archie now pushes his man off. Archie counterpunched with the right. There's the bell ending the round. Keep it tuned here on ESPN Classic for more of the Marciano-Archie Moore title fight. More combat ahead. Archie saved by the bell at the end of round eight. How long can the old mongoose survive the relentless attack from The Rock? Find out here on ESPN Classics Ringside. Rocky looks good. Boys come out quickly. Round number eight it is. Moore slips the left lead, lets it roll by that right here, gets away from the right, and hooks on the mouth of the champion. The champion works his way forward. Rocky Marciano from Brockton digs him with the right, gets cut with the right uppercut, digs with another right to the body, and is wild with the right, aimed at the jaw. Archie Moore backs off, blocks the left hook with the right glove high in the air. Moore, meantime, faints with the left, hooks towards the body. Meantime, Rocky Marciano coming in, sticks out a jab. Rocky gets away from the punch and cracks the right near the ear and throws a good one-two punch on the jaw and a good uppercut on, on Marciano's jaw. Moore fired three good shots that time. Moore now backs away, blocks the left hook high in the air. Archie Moore with his arms and elbows in front of him most of the time. A good defense is wild with an uppercut aimed at the jaw of the champion. The challenger with the left hand rather low. We're in round number eight, midway in the scheduled 15 rounder here at Yankee Stadium in New York City. A left hook high on the head and a left on the right, a right to the jaw by uh, Mr. Marciano. Marciano digs forward now, is wild with the right. Rocky setting the pace, setting the pace, moving forward most of the time. Gets away from the right, aimed at his jaw. And Rocky is wild with a right swing, gets caught with a stiff jab on his nose. Gets caught with another jab and throws the right uppercut to move Archie Moore back near our microphones, right above our blue ribbon microphones. Rocky is wild with another swing. Rocky is definitely a swinger. He hurts Moore with the right hand, and Moore hooks backing away. Moore jabs backing away now. Moore with arms in front of him once more, stands his ground, far side of the ring, neutral corner, rolls side to side. Rocky can't seem to get him to stand still. Rocky's wild with the right, short with the left, aims with the right to the body, and Moore gets out of the corner with the left hook, gets on his bicycle, rolls back, backs up. Moore gets away from a punch, gets away from another left hook, gets away from a right. I see Moore now, throws a right uppercut. Meantime, with seconds remaining, Moore digs to the body, comes up to the jaw. Only seconds to go in the safe round. Moore gets over the hard right and goes down. Two, three, four, five. I believe the bell will save him. Six. The bell saves him on six. All right, Russ. Archie Moore is up to uh, his feet at the end of round eight, and he was in quite a bit of difficulty. Welcome back to ringside. Rocky Marciano here on ESPN Classics. So the bell saves Archie Moore in the eighth round of the 1955 title fight with Marciano. But how much more punishment can Moore absorb? Let's get back to the action. Marciano Moore, the ninth round. Here is round nine and Marciano comes out stalking him. Marciano lands the left and the right. This is the long right hand. Moore puts his hands down to his midsection, tries to guard his midsection, sneaks one right hand in on as Marciano comes in on him, swinging the left hand for the head. Moore trying to hang on. Now he shoots a light left hand to the chin of the champion. And Rocky Marciano on the rope puts two savage left hooks and a right cross to Archie Moore's head. Moore battling back with a straight left, but Marciano's on him again with another straight right to the jaw. Marciano trying to find Moore and lose his target, leaving and bobbing, but Archie scores with a left and a right to the head and almost uh, put Marciano back on his heels momentarily. Rocky paying no attention to the defense, is digging to the midsection twice. Again, misses the right uppercut, lands on the top of the head with a right hand. Archie Moore now he's stung with a terrific right hand on the ear and another one as he continues to weave and bob and roll along the rope. Marciano with a light right high on the head, down a left hook to the jaw and another left hand. Moore swings and scores with a right hand with his chin, but it doesn't phase the champion at all. 
Marciano going into the crowd, scores with a clubbing right to the nose of Archie Moore, and then misses two left foot scores with a right hand. Moore now hanging on, is battered twice, goes down, and here is the count. The left hand hitting down is four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Moore does not get up. Rocky Marciano is still the heavyweight champion of the world. Rocky Marciano knocks out Archie Moore. The time, the time, one minute, 19 seconds of the ninth round. Winner by a knockout and still heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. <laughs> oh, Rocky Marciano, very quick to see if Archie was all right, because he would later say that that was the most punishment he ever dished out. Where does it rate, before we get to this being his last fight, Bert, where does this rate among Rocky's great performances? I think it's one of them. Uh, the caliber of opponent, Archie Moore, uh, the amount of punches he took, meaning Rocky Marciano. But it was his last fight. There's an irony here. For the 32-year-old Marciano, this is his last fight. For the 42 going on 45-year-old Moore, he will fight nine more years despite this, mm. this beating. And have another shot at the title, trying to win a vacant title uh, mm -hmm. against Floyd Patterson. Mm -hmm. George, what did you see watch, watching that round? Power. This Archimo had all the skills, but he just couldn't resist the power of the real heavyweight. Marciano seemed to be similar in height, but the power in this man was just too great. He couldn't overcome that power. You know, there's an irony here, too. The light heavyweight champion, Archie Moore, weighs more than the heavyweight champion, yep. Rocky Marciano. You know, one thing that comes to me watching this is Marciano's style. He was always a, you know, a guy that was offensive-minded. He was busy. But in his fight, he was much busier. And it wasn't by accident. And that's one of the things that I talk about, the intellect, that he was smart enough to make adjustments when he had to. He stepped up his pace because of two reasons. One, he knew that... Mar he knew that that Archie Moore was a great defensive fighter. So he figured if he pitched a lot of punches at him, he'd keep him playing defense. And if he was playing defense, he couldn't hurt him. He couldn't do anything back to him. And also, the turtle defense. When you go into that turtle defense, and this man used it a little bit, there's one problem with it. If a man stays close to you, you've got to pull your hand back to punch. Now, when you pull your hand back, you expose yourself. So Marciano stayed in the pocket, chucking at him, because he knew when he pulled his hand back, bang, bang, he'd fill the hole. So Marciano knew what he was doing to step up his pace of punches in this particular fight. Anyway, there was all-time great fights to come, as you mentioned, uh, Bert, Yvonne Durrell against Archie Moore. How is, uh, you know, how do you think that's possible? I think genetics play a part. Look, George is still here and is still in great shape. How does I'm, I'm going to get him to hit you. Yeah, so, no, it's a, no, it's a, how, how is that, a after that pounding, you feel he's that, able you to test that pound? No, I, wanna, <laughs> wanna, I like watching it on tape. I'm good. Uh, how, does, how is that possible that he's able to absorb that and then come back and have these all-time wars? I just think it shows what an extraordinary fighter Archie Moore was. I really do. Uh, here he puts up, I won't say the fight of his life, that might have been Jovan Durrell, but this was one of the fights of his life. The point is, he was a warrior. And maybe as Teddy alluded to earlier, he had waited so long for his chance, he was not going to let it go. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of truth. This is a man who went through a hard life. You know, it was harder in those days. He waited 10 years past when he mm. should have got the light heavyweight shot. He was the best light heavyweight in the world, number one. Mm -hmm. And they made him wait until he was like 38 and until his late 30s to finally get that shot for the title. So he didn't want to let go. Hey, George, now he had the, Archie had the Durrell fights in his, in, his, uh, in his video library, right, or his film library. You watched those fights? I watched those fights, and uh, it was remarkable because to man, for a man to take that kind of a beating, he was really knocked out a few times and jumps up anyway. Light for the light heavy heavyweight title, he loved that title. He loved being called champion of the world at that weight. He wasn't going to give it up, and I couldn't understand how he did this. So Marciano's 32. Bert, coming off this great performance, he retires. Why? I think he knew this was going to be his last fight. And the reason is, quite simply, he wanted out of his contract with Al Weil, his manager. He thought Weil was not protecting his interests. I mean, otherwise, how did he get less money to defend his title against the former champion, Joe Walcott, than Walcott got challenging? But even more importantly, his previous fight had been against Don Cockell out in San Francisco. There had been an investigation into the mob out in San Francisco, or the state, 
Governor Goodwin Knight had initiated it of boxing, undercover managers, etc. The promoter of the fight, Cockell and Marciano, had written a check to Al Weil, who had cashed it surreptitiously, no money going to Marciano, and he found out about it because of this investigation. So I think he knew, and when they came out the following April in 56, with his announcement that he'd injured his back throwing his daughter in the air, which sounded a little bit contrived, he just decided he was quitting. Not so much because he was walking away from the sport, because he always harbored the desire mm -hmm. to fight again, but he was walking away from any contact from Al Weil and never talked to him again. Bad finances have broken many a fighter. Uh, it happened uh, through the years, and in this case, Marciano would walk away, but it was not his final fight. Rocky Marciano would come back for a super fight, a most unusual super fight against Muhammad Ali in 1970. We'll have a look at that when we come back on Classic Ringside. Welcome back to Ringside, Rocky Marciano. We're back here in Gleason's gym in Brooklyn. In the late 1960s, radio host Maury Warner set out to answer the question, who is the best heavyweight of all time? Using computer analysis, he broadcast a series of fantasy fights on his show, and it was determined that Rocky Marciano was the best of all time. Of course, it really didn't solve anything, but it sparked an idea for using modern technology to match fighters from different eras, and it led to one of the most unusual showdowns in boxing. Muhammad Ali versus Rocky Marciano, a super fight. The two legends actually put on the gloves and fought 75 staged one-minute rounds, each with different criteria. All the data was then fed into a computer, and a winner was determined. The fight was released in movie theaters January 20th, 1970. Hi. If you ever want to see a great fight, a real ring classic, watch me, Rocky Marciano, fight a computerized fight with Cassius Clay. Now, from Warner Productions, a new era in sports. The Super Fight, the only two undefeated heavyweight champions in history. Rocky Marciano and Muhammad Ali actually meet for the all-time heavyweight championship of the world. piece of action you've just seen is all anyone in the world will see till 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, January 20th, when for one time and one time only, these two great champions meet in combat. Rocky Marciano and Muhammad Ali, live on color film in a bout that was filmed in secret. There will be no second runs. The fight will never be seen on television or in newsreels. It's one chance and one chance only. Get your tickets now before they're sold out. If you want to see one of the greatest fight classics of all time, then watch me, Muhammad Ali, who will be fighting Rocky Marciano on the computerized heavyweight championship of the world. All right, so fascinating stuff. I want to back up, though, Bert, the, that whole radio fantasy fight series. Where was Muhammad Ali? He didn't get to Rocky Marciano? You have to understand, he, uh, Murray Warner had paired him off. 16 mm -hmm. fighters, 16 heavyweight champions. It just so happened that Muhammad Ali was in the same bracket as Jim Jeffries. You know Jim Jeffries. Yeah. He lost. <laughs> lost to Jim Jeffries. In yeah. the computer, the Honeywell, right. IBM, whatever the hell it was, computer. You remember those? They had cards that would flip out. And, Large computers yes. back in the day. Yes. Yeah. And Muhammad Ali was not happy with this. This is during the time of his being defrocked and exiled. Mm -hmm. He sued. He said, how in the hell can I lose? He, he might get that to hold up. Did he get it to hold up? He got a pretty good case. Murray Warner now comes up with an idea. What is his idea? Well, to solve this suit, you, Mr. Ali, and you, Mr. Marciano, if I can get you, will participate in the finals, which just happened to go quickly through like a computer. Mm -hmm. Now we got him in the finals. You'll fight. He signs him up. They go through all these rounds, and it is packaged with nobody knowing the results. 21 different endings, 75 different rounds for closed circuit theaters. And it's a packed house. It's like going to a fight. This was it. 
and nobody knows the ending, and there are two different endings depending upon where you are. Oh, oh it was different even in depending on the theater, really. So well, there were some Ali wins. I thought this was there was a Marciano win. There's a Marciano win in the United States and in England. Ali wins on cuts. The, his nose, his nose. And it, uh, but nobody knows the nose knows. In fact, Rocky Marciano never knows. He's dead before it comes out. He had, he had trained down. Remember, he's retired. Right. He had trained for this. Ali is exiled. He trains for this. Even Rocky Marciano's toupee trains for this. <laughs> it, it loses five pounds. Lou, yeah. what's, what's Rocky's thought on but, this? Let, what let, he... let me tell you Rocky calls me up after it's over, and they're coming into New York. They're, having, they're going to have steak dinner. Ali's coming with them. So he invited me over there. And he says, Lou, why are you over there? He says, when... Uh, you're sitting next to Ali. Just ask him about his ribs. You understand? And that, see what he says. So when he comes over there, when he comes over there, I just say, you know, what happened to me? He's not that tough, is he, Rocky? Are you crazy? He says he lifts up his shirt, all big red blotches over there. So he was, every time that he would say something, every time we try to knock off his wig or something like that, or get cute, Rocky would go, boom, hit him <laughs> in the ribs. Boom! Hit him in the room. You're crazy! You're crazy! He, he would do that, and he, that's what that's that's what he did. So you can imagine if there was a fight for 15 rounds, what could have happened? Who could have won the fight? Every every time mm -hmm. Ali started to play, because you know Ali is playful, right? And he's trying to knock off his way, and he does a couple times. Yeah. And after one warning, and that's what all Rocky gave him. Every time he did, oof! Yeah, in the ribs, in uh, the ribs. Let it be known it stopped after a while. <laughs> it, it, it was, and, and this was a sellout in every closed circuit house. You know, Lou, the one thing is, it's hard. Uh, and Ali, in the 60s, in his prime, the way he was able to move in a oh, real fight, could absolutely. Rocky have found him? He'd find him someplace. He'd hit him in the, hit him in the ankles. He hit him in the ribs. He hit him in the, in the knees. But he would find him. He would find his upper body some, some, somehow. He'd get him. He'd step on his feet and get close to him. He would find him. Fifteen rounds is a long time. Would he find him, Bert? I don't think so. But then again, what he we found everybody else. Yeah. Right? Well, that's, that's, yeah, that yeah, much he got. You're you, right. You must remember at this magic moment in time, Ali is not ascended to the place in history and our memory has yet mm -hmm. and it was a question about it and Marciano's star still burned brightly. Right. It was still weren't the Frazier right. fights yes. and it so, wasn't as so you got that. Foreman. Right. And so I think the tendency is to agree with Lou at that point. You know, granted everything is relative except maybe Eve telling Adam about all the men she could have married. But this is relative <laughs> in terms of time. Oh, you got that. That's from your greatest hits. Uh, I have that CD. Yeah, yes. you got All that. Right. When we come back, good stuff. Here's good form for this late in the day. When we come back, though, again, what is left for Rocky Marciano? Again, the retirement and the tragic end. And some very interesting stories with Lou Duva on Rocky Marciano. We'll take a break. We're back at Gleason's gym after this. Rocky Marciano was the only heavyweight champion in history to retire undefeated. He grew up in a poor and an Italian neighborhood up in Brockton, Massachusetts, and lived what is possibly one of the most bizarre lives following his career uh, as anybody I've ever, I've ever looked at in sports. I mean, he would only take cash at functions. He hid money in pipes, in, uh, in, in wall outlets. He opened up bank accounts that were not in his name and put money in there. Nobody knows today where all of Rocky's money is. I can't fully explain it, but he had a, not only a lust for money, but a lust for cash. If it were possible to avoid it, he would not accept checks. For one thing, he never wanted to pay taxes on anything. And uh, the other thing, he just liked the feel and the look of cash. Uh, $2,000 in cash meant more to him than a $50,000 check, which doesn't make any financial sense, but that's the way he was. He was offered a $5,000 check once up in Montreal for giving a speech after dinner, and he told the man at the dinner party, he said, I'm sorry, I don't take checks. And his accountant who was with him said, Rocky, this is a cashier's check. It's like money. He said, don't tell me my business. I want cash. So the chairman of the dinner had to go all around the room, black tie dinner, and collect cash from the people.
and he gave him $2,500, and Rocky gave him the check and said thank you. All right. Lou, why? I mean, look, I think we understand. Edward Pope is there saying, I think we all like the feel of cash. Sure. But why to this extent, Lou? Brian, let me tell you a story. This guy here, you know, he loved cash. There's no doubt about that. Um, he just got done with a segment of his, uh, his uh, movie uh, series over there, main events that he had on with different entertainers and different sports stars and stuff like that. We get done with that, and he says, Lou, let's go over to Lindy's. I've got to see some of the people over there and have some fun. You know, and we'll have a sandwich. That's fine. So we grabbed the cab. We went down to Lindy's over in, over in, uh, in, in New York, over on 49th and, uh, and Broadway. So we go in there, and he gives me a package here. Check this here. Check my jacket. We go put it in there. Go over there. And we're there a couple hours. We're eating. We're dining. We're telling jokes. and so We're going back, right? We grab our jackets. Go over, grab a cab, and go down to West End Avenue where his apartment was. And he says, Lou, where's the package? I said, what package? The package I gave you the whole. Holy Christmas, I, I said, I left it in the thing. Well, he, we better get down there. We ran downstairs, grabbed the cab, went over. I went in and luckily the, cab, the package was right there. Take the cab back to the uh, West End. And he opens, it, he opens up the package. He says, look, Lou. He says, I got this here from the fights. $50,000 in cash. I said, what are you going to do with all that cash? He says, take it home. Don't worry about it. He says, I don't know what to do. What do? He says, walked around with fifty grand. $50,000. In, in, in an unmarked package. Mm -hmm. he, he would leave bags on cabs. He'd forget them. $1,000, $2,000. And yes, he did, as, as myth would have it, have money in bank accounts and under other names like W.C. Fields is reputed to have had by opening him in his Cuthbert, J. Twilly and other names he used <laughs> in movies, Edward Suisse. He was, um, early in his uh, career, I think Al Wow said he liked him, his manager, because money is his god. But let me tell you a story that was told on him by Teddy Brenner, the great matchmaker, who is the matchmaker at Madison Square Garden, and he's putting on a big fight, and here comes the retired Rocky Marciano, who comes in and says, Teddy, could you give me 12 free tickets, friends I'm bringing uh, for the fight? He says, well, Rock, we're, we're, in, we're in business here. You remember you wanted every fight on closed circuit so you could make money, not free tea? We we're trying to do that. Come on, Teddy, we're friends. All right, here's the 12. Don't bother me again. Sure as a dickens the next day. Teddy, I need six more uh, tickets for that fight. Rocky, I told you yesterday. He says, I got something for you anyway. He opens a drawer, and there's a check for $9,000 for residuals for fights that he's run, Madison Square Garden has, of Rocky Marciano fights. He gives them to him, and Rocky says, just don't tell Al Weil, my manager. Mm. He says, thank you very much, Teddy. As he stops at the door, he says, what about those six free tickets? <laughs> he wasn't he, giving it up. He, everything. <laughs> everything was free. Why, why the plane to Iowa? Again, August 31st, 1969. That was, again, Rocky Marciano's love of the dollar. It was the day before his birthday. He was supposed to be going home to spend it with his family. Right. And yet, somebody came to him and said, I would give you a couple bucks if you will come to Des Moines, a contractor friend of his, and appear at a birthday party, we'll throw up there, then you can go up home, on home. Mm -hmm. We've got, let's give you money for a ticket for a plane. Well, wouldn't you know it, Marciano decided not to spend the money on the plane. He went with another friend on a flight to Des Moines and it never landed, or at least it didn't land at the airport. And let me, let me just touch on that also. Before he took that plane, he called me up. He called me up. He says, Lou, I want to get together with you. He says, I got a good thing for me, you, my brothers, and all. It seemed that Lou Perini, I think he, won, he owned uh, Milwaukee Braves at the time. Yeah, one of the three shovels right. who owned it. And what they were going to do was put up Rocky Marsh and a pizzeria, Italian, put a, him, him, him up on neon signs, and they were going to have eight states given to them as a concession. And he wanted to give me New Jersey. He was going to take uh, Florida. His brother would take up a New England, and we had that all said. Finally, that would be great. He also, if I'm not mistaken, had another another offer for national car rentals that he was going to do commercials for the for the people. He had all those things going for him. We we're going to talk about it, and then the next day I'm coming from the shore, and my wife and kids with me, and boom, I hear that there thing. I almost ran off the road. I couldn't believe. How, how just how di I know it's difficult to even talk about, you know, in, 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 even in the space of this show. How, how difficult was it? I mean, how hard did it hit you and, and everyone who was around Rocky? 
I... Did you believe you had it a, at first? Uh, no, I didn't believe it at first. I made sure I called up, made a couple of calls and all that, and then find out, yes, it was. I knew it was birthday being the next day and all. But um, how, how, do you, how do you handle something that's so close to you? It's like your brother, maybe your father, maybe your wife, maybe any That's so close to you that you love, idolize. And if you wanted to be anybody at all, you would want to be a Rocky Marciano, you know? Right. And that's how it hurt me. I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm on this earth, Rocky Marciano was my guy, my friend. And I can't say enough about him. And when they say the word champ, there's only one, that, one, one meaning to it, Rocky Marciano. That's great, Lou. Thanks so much. A great way to wrap this up. Thanks once again to Gleason's Gym for allowing us to provide this uh, backdrop to the Brockton Blockbusters epic story. And thanks to all of our guests as well. Angelo Dundee, George Foreman, Bill Gallo, and Lou Duva, and of course, Burt Randolph Sugar. Thank you so much. Teddy Atlas as well. Yeah. by here as well. We'll get Teddy in. Thank you so much for being with us again. Ringside, Rocky Marciano. Until next time, I'm Brian Kenny. Have a great night.